Hello and welcome. This is another one in the series of seminars that the Chen Institute and Science Magazine have organized. Um, we had our first series last year and it was an outstanding success. So we decided we want to continue with this series. And um, every year we are taking cutting edge research from the field of neuroscience and then invite some of the leading players um, in the field to present their most recent work. Um, the topic of today is going to be modern neuromodulation tools. And as you all know, this is one of the hottest topics at the moment. Neuromodulation is made of two parts. We want to investigate the organism, in this case, the brain, the nervous system, um, as non-invasively as possible. And then we want also to interfere with it. We want to modulate it. And um, the speakers we invited for this session are at the cutting edge of this research. They all have done enormous contributions over the last years. And we are happy that they will be taking part and sharing their latest findings with us. So um, without further ado, I want to invite our first speaker is Weijan Yang from UC Davis. And um, he is affiliated with the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. And I recently learned he's also associated with neuroengineering. So you can already see very often our speakers straddle between these two different fields. But I think that if you want to make progress, you really have to come from these different angles. So I'm really happy to have Weijan here. And um, the title of his talk is Two Photon Imaging and Manipulation of Neural Circuits. So Weijan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Peter, for the introduction. And of course, I would like to thank again the organizer for inviting me here. It's really my great honor to uh, discuss uh, our research with you uh, with the title of Two Photon Imaging and Manipulation of Neural Circuits. So um, before we go into that um, imaging and manipulation, I would like to uh, say that uh, we have a vast uh, span of uh, order of magnitude in terms of spatial scale for the neural uh, structure. So starting from the nanometer scale and channel to, to the micron scale, then to the spine, and then to the tens of micron uh, neuronal cell body, and then to the nine millimeter scale local circuit to all the way to the entire brain. So uh, different structure have its, uh, uh, its own importance in, uh, in making our brain function, uh, in making our brain fun functional. So, um, one important question in neuroscience is actually how our, our behavior emerges from the cellular activity, and then um, we think that uh, to answer this question, the neuronal cir circuits, which is in the order of like a hundred of micron scale to millimeter scale, will be an important link. Uh, between the cellular activity and the uh, uh, animal behavior. So uh, our research interest is mainly on this uh, so-called missile scale. So on the order of light, uh, hundred of micron to, to, uh, to a millimeter uh, scale, the one circuit. So uh, our, uh, my, my talk today will mainly focus on this uh, spatial scale. Um, so talking about the neuronal circuit, so I would like to I show you uh, one specific uh, like uh, one specific example. Uh, so uh, the ability to image the neuronal activity in the brain circuit is actually very important. So what we show here is the functional imaging of a neural activity in the mouse visual cortex. So whenever we see the <coughs> cell is blinking, <coughs> we know that that specific cell will have a uh, neuronal activity. So what we do here is that we inject the virus into the uh, mouse brain. Uh, that virus is quite special, so it will express a fluorescent protein. And this fluorescent protein, again, is quite, uh, quite uh, special. 
uh, whenever the brain has uh, activity at that specific neuron, that um, there will be cal calcium going from extracellular space into the cell body. And that would change the conformation of the fall floor, turning that from the dark state into the bright state. So when we illuminate that with excitation lights, we will be able to uh, uh, see the uh, fluorescence, which will indicate its uh, activity. So if we look at this movie uh, uh, a little bit more carefully, from time to time, we will see that there is a, a, some a group of new ones that will have uh, activity. So um, we call that the one or ensemble. So which is defined as a group of new ones that show spatial and temporal uh, co-activation. So um, showing in this culture is probably three different neuronal ensemble, which will show uh, co-activations within each group. So uh, more and more evidence uh, in recent research is showing that the coordinate activity of neuronal ensemble drive the perception and, and behavior. So as a result, it is uh, very important for us to have the capability to image the neuronal uh, ensemble's activity and further we man manipulate that or modulate its activity and then to see um, what is the, the consequence to the uh, animal behavior so to establish some causal relationships. Uh, so one example of the um, uh, animal uh, behavior that's, that we, we commonly use it is a visual discrimination task. So uh, shown here is one specific example. So what we have is that we have an animal that is half fixed and then it's running on a treadmill. And in front of that, there is a, a monitor displaying the visual discrimination task. So what we will see is that depending on what type of visual stimulation pattern that we display on the LCD screen, that the mouse will either leak to the water spout on the left or on the right to connect the water with wall. So during this process, we will be able to uh, 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 read out uh, the, the brain states of the, the, the mouse so that we know whether uh, the mouse knows whether it's, uh, it's pattern A or pattern B from the leaking behavior. So let's take a look at this uh, very briefly. So here you see that we have a vertical by stripes moving on the monitor and then the mouse is leaking on this uh, water spots on, on the mouse uh, left hand side. And then uh, now it's horizontal and then it moves to the uh, left hand side. So uh, we use this uh, animal uh, behavior uh, like paradigms to, to um, add as a, as a, uh, as a approach to to without the, the, the brain, brain state. And then meanwhile, we image uh, the neuronal activity and modulate the neuronal activity and see whether there's a causal uh, relationship between the neuronal activity and the uh, animal behavior. So uh, what we really want to do is that doing this animal behavior, we try to do the uh, imaging of a specific brain regions, uh, that's the observation. And then after we, see what type of neuron are active, we can uh, use optogenetics to probe their functional activity, for example. And furthermore, we use uh, optogenetics or optical manipulations to manipulate uh, uh, neuronal activity on the ensemble level and see whether we can modulate the animal's uh, behavior to establish a causal relationship again. So uh, this is basically a closed loop uh, paradigm between uh, animal behavior experiment, imaging experiment, and optical manipulation or optical modulation experiments. So uh, in this talk, I will mainly um, discuss three different uh, subtopics. So the first one is uh, two photon imaging of neural activity. <clears throat> and I will show you that this two photon imaging you will have a good cellular resolution deep into the tissue. And uh, furthermore, it also have a high, uh, uh, optical throughput, meaning that you can image uh, a population of new ones uh, in a good uh, spatial and temporal uh, uh, resolution. And then after we do the imaging, uh, that we will be able to establish the map of the, uh, the, the new world circuits. And then uh, I will introduce a, a, a special technique called holographic uh, 
uh, optogenetics that can manipulate the neuronal activity. So um, we will show you that it has a very high precision, uh, very good at uh, cellular uh, level uh, resolution and then also a milliseconds uh, time scale temporal resolution. And more importantly, uh, it can uh, modulate a group of neurons uh, activity together. So not only a single neuron, but a group of user selected or user defined uh, neurons. Uh, and finally, using these imaging tools and uh, uh, manipulation tools, I will show you that there's uh, some interesting um, uh, biological uh, uh, investigation on how we can uh, trigger animal behavior using optogenetic and, and potentially reprogram or program the neural network of the brain. So, um, so the, let's go into the first topic, uh, two photon uh, imaging. Um, so uh, optical methods are, are among various techniques, are actually are ideal uh, recording tools uh, in terms of the uh, studying of the neural circuits. Uh, so compared with uh, electrophysiology, which is uh, also a uh, commonly used uh, techniques, uh, optical methods, it, it has advantage of a relatively uh, large field view. We can see a lot of neurons together in a, a relatively local area. And uh, it's relatively uh, non-invasive, particularly for the uh, superficial uh, layer of the brain. And it also can, um, uh, we, we will also be able to use image tool to, to do the imaging uh, in a chronic uh, study. So day by day or even to the month. So uh, this is the, the uh, good advantage of optical methods. So as we saw, we think that uh, in terms of the missile scale neural circuits, optical method is one of the very ideal tools uh, to investigate their neuronal activity. Uh, and in specifically, uh, uh, two photon microscopes will provide the optical access to deep tissue with a very high resolution and signal quality. So, so on the right hand side is a comparison of the a common use one photon uh, imaging technique and, and, and the two photon imaging technique. So, on the, uh, in the middle, it is a, a, a fluorescent liquid, and on the right is an objective lens that uh, to project the uh, one photon. Uh, focusing beam. Uh, and then on the left, it is a two photon focusing beam. So as we see uh, here, for the one photon beam, there will be, at, we will actually see a cone. So uh, essentially we are uh, uh, like exciting all the four floor around this, this cone structure. So uh, it has a very poor three direction because we are not only seeing the information at the focal plane, but also on the top and on the bottom. Whereas for two photon uh, excitation, because the excitation efficiency is uh, uh, proportional to the square of the light intensity. So only at the very particular focal point that it will excite the fluorescence. So uh, in, in this particular case that we will say, we will say that it has the really good optical session capability because we are only uh, uh, seeing the um, information at that particular focal point. So it will give a very sharp uh, image and very good signal quality. So uh, for two photon imaging, uh, a typical way to, uh, to, to form image is by scanning the laser focus across the sample and then connect the fluorescence sequentially, point by point, just like what we show in this diagram. So for the top print, we will scan the laser spots like us in a zigzag way. And once we finish the first uh, uh, print, we will go back either to the beginning of that uh, scanning position, or we can go to another uh, imaging depth. And then, uh, then we repeat this process for functional imaging. So uh, this is the uh, sequential scanning nature of two photon microscope. So uh, since it's uh, invention uh, back in the 1990s for biological uh, imaging, two photon microscope has been one of the uh, workhorse in neuroscience research. Uh, but the main disadvantage of that is that it is relatively slow. So um, in my research, we are trying to uh, increase the um, uh, optical uh, nice, uh, 
throughput of the two photo imaging, meaning that uh, can we increase the imaging speed? Uh, can we uh, increase the imaging volume at a certain amount of time? So, um, so uh, I, uh, I would uh, like to show you two of our contribution in, in this area. So uh, the first one is imaging through comprehensive measurement. So um, in the conventional two photo microscope, as we mentioned just now, we uh, do one pixel per measurement. So one pixel per time, and as a result, it is low. So um, our contribution here is that we're thinking, uh, can we do multiple pixels per measurement? So uh, basically we measure uh, information of n pixels together. We summarize that into a single measurement. So it is fast in terms of the uh, imaging speed because we reduce our, our scanning spot by, 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 uh, not by, a number, uh, by a factor of n, right? So, but on the other hand, since all n pixels are measured together, so we would like to mix those information. So uh, we develop a tools to computationally recover this n pixel. So um, let's take a look at this diagram a little more. So here, this is a cartoon of the brain, brain uh, stru structure. So normally we will just imaging a uh, single brain point by point sequentially. Uh, but uh, here we use our special device called spatial by modulator to split the laser spots into, for example, two different spots. And then these two different spots can locate it at different depths. And then these two spots will scan across two different planes simultaneously. And then for each uh, uh, like pair of spots, their information will be uh, overlaid together. So for example, on the bottom, we saw that originally there's a two different plane A and B. Normally we image them one by one so we can see A and B. Uh, but because we, we, we do this uh, compressive measurement, so we will just get one single measurement, but the two planes information will get overlaid. So uh, essentially we, we are looking at A and B together. So of course the question is that how are we going to distinguish this A and B, how are we going to separate? So uh, in the following, I will introduce the computational um, approach. Uh, but before that, let's take a look at the, some demonstration here. So um, here we show that uh, there's two different imaging planes. One is the layer two, three of the mouse cortex, the other is layer five. So we see that they are at different uh, planes. And this is the conventional approach to do the imaging. So uh, they are uh, basically uh, well sharp and then they are se separate. And then um, if we do a mathematical manipulation of these two images, then we can sum them together and become this uh, summation. So uh, notice that the uh, color scale here, it is, um, uh, it is a nice pseudo color. So all of them essentially is green, but I use the red color to, to uh, and the green color here to differentiate the two different points. Uh, so this is the mathematical summation. And then if we uh, use our technique and then we scan the two points simultaneously, we will get the image on the right. So if we do the comparison between the third column and the fourth column, we see that they are pretty much the same. So um, on the bottom, it's basically showing that um, we use a computational approach to autom automatically find out the uh, neuronal uh, footprint so we can extract the neural uh, activity on uh, individual uh, cells. And then obviously when we do the dual plane uh, imaging, uh, here n equal to two here, right? n equal to two, um, and we will see that the, uh, the two different planes neuron, they overlap together. So um, then we devise a computational method to, to do the separation. So the, um, the physical intuition of that is that we will per first perform the structural imaging of individual prints so that we extract the new ones for individual prints. Um, and then afterwards that we leverage the uh, spatial temporal sparsity of the neural activity, meaning that not all the new ones, they, they are active together. Uh, uh, in the normal physiology uh, uh, state. So now we're using that, then we will be able to recover the signal of individual uh, neurons from, from the two different planes. So here we show one specific example. So um, 
this specific uh, spatial uh, footprint is continuous with true new world. And then this is the spatial, uh, the temporal activity traces. Uh, and then um, using the competition uh, uh, approach, uh, we will be able to mix the uh, two different sources that contribute to this spatial footprint here. So uh, we see that one of them is uh, from one single plane on the top and the other is on the bottom plane, and then we can separate it and the world activity. And then on the right hand side, we can also further do the denoising uh, using the same uh, approach. And then uh, we can see that the, compared to the wall image, our denoise image will look uh, much nicer. So this is one type of uh, uh, approach to increase the throughput. Um, and the other approach that, that we try to input the throughput, again, it is through uh, beam multiplexing, but instead of uh, like use computational approach to mix the um, information from the two different beam or three different beams. Uh, we use the different uh, four of those colors to optically separate them. So in this specific uh, case, we use two different lasers and then each laser will image a specific depth. So for example, the first laser image the top plane and then the second laser image the bottom plane and then new ones and each depth here, they are tagged with four of those that emitting different color. And for example, the one on the top will be emitting the green color, the one on the bottom emitting the red color. So, um, and we know that uh, optically, we will be able to separate these colors. So as we saw, we will be able to simultaneously imaging the top plane and the bottom plane uh, together. And then uh, after that, we can sequentially step uh, the different depth of the top layer and the bottom layer to further increase the uh, uh, imaging volume here. So by the end, we will be able to uh, image thousands of cells uh, in a very uh, high uh, temporal uh, uh, at the uh, temporal resolution. So shown here is that uh, uh, ten different uh, depths. Uh, uh, dual activity uh, imaging. Uh, the top five planes, they are using uh, the green uh, calcium indicator. So they emit the green color and then bottom layer in, in emit the, the, the red color. So I would like to uh, uh, emphasize that uh, uh, these two contribution, they have a sheer, uh, sheer um, feature that is the beam multiplexing. And then, um, the only difference is that how are we going to separate that? And then these two methods, they're actually orthogonal to each other so they can be combined together. And then um, uh, recently there has also been a very good development from many different labs around the world that also try to use beam multiplexing. And they also have like different ways to do the uh, uh, deep multiplexing or deep mixing. So to really pushing two photon microscopes uh, into a new level in terms of optical throughput. And this set up a very good foundation for the newer modulation using uh, holographic optogenetic, which will be uh, my following topic here. So to briefly introduce uh, optogenetics. So optogenetic has been um, um, used in neuroscience for, for a long time already. Uh, so um, this diagram show a uh, uh, very uh, basic uh, principle. So um, in optogenetics techniques, we um, express a very special uh, membrane protein onto the cell. So this membrane protein, it is light sensitive. So in this specific example, um, when we don't have the light, then this uh, membrane protein, which is actually a uh, uh, iron channel, the gate will close. So the iron from outside will not go inside the cell body. And then when we shine the light onto this, uh, 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 this uh, iron channel, light sensitive iron channel that the gate will open so that the iron from outside can go inside. And this could uh, like change the neural uh, activity. Uh, either uh, uh, activate that or, or silence that. So this is the technique uh, called optogenetics. And then just show one specific example that we do in the lab. So here we are doing simultaneously uh, imaging and simultaneous uh, optogenetics. So uh, on the one hand, we are seeing the cell activity uh, spontaneously. Um, 
activity. And then on the other hand, uh, at periodically, uh, we activate the entire plane's neurons simultaneously so that we see all the cells turn, up, uh, turn on at that particular moment. So that is the effect of optogenetics. So uh, in this case, uh, we will need to use uh, two different um, uh, lay two different laser to 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 do this uh, so-called all optical approach. One of the laser is trying to do the imaging, uh, and the other laser is to do this uh, 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 activation uh, activate light sensitive options. So um um before we go into more detail of the holographic optogenetic approach, I would like to briefly review uh, the uh, typical approach to do the um, Spring modulation. So um, that is the electro array. So basically, uh, we will uh, uh, one can uh, uh, like uh, insert the electro array into the uh, brain structure, and then um, by um, by uh, uh, can, uh, by injecting the current into this electro, which will go into the brain, we will be able to like modulate. The brain activity. So it's a very mature uh, technology, um, but um, the disadvantage is that it's relatively invasive because it requires the insertion of the sharp electro onto the uh, brain volume. So it is invasive. And it also has a lack of spatial specificity because when it's uh, uh, when the current is injected into the brain, uh, of course, it will locally stimulate the uh, uh, new ones around that uh, electro, but there's also uh, cells that is further away from this electro will also get more or less uh, get stimulated. So there's a lack of spatial specificity. And then um, essentially, we do not know uh, which cell is, I, I, I mean, we couldn't control which cell is being uh, uh, stimulated uh, in the local environment. So uh, the second approach. It is through optogenetics. So optogenetic that I introduced just now. So for optogenetic, this um, uh, we we can specifically uh, express the so-called uh, optogenetic actuator. So that is the ion channel, the membic ion channel that we discussed earlier. We can express that at a certain uh, cell cell type. So as we saw, optogenetic can be cell type specific. So it is better compared to the uh, electrical wave approach. Uh, but nevertheless, using one photon approach, uh, which is a uh, very uh, uh, common uh, strategy nowadays in optogenetics, there is a lack of spatial specificity because uh, a large area of the uh, neuronal tissue will be stimulated uh, at the same time. So there's a lack of spatial specificity here. Um, and then here we want my like to introduce the uh, our work on the uh, holographic uh, approach. So here, using two photon approach, uh, and remember earlier that we see that the two photon excitation spot is extremely small, so that we can only excite specific neurons. Uh, and on top of that, if we can engineering the beam profile, so that we will be able to select different neurons uh, together as a group, and then we can photo stimulate that. All together. So here, it not only have cell type specificity, but it also have a high spatial specificity. And then we can choose a specific group of neurons that we want to uh, modulate, and then uh, we can uh, uh, encode that information into our optics so that we can actuate these uh, cells. Uh, so, uh, so what does uh, holographic mean? So holographic, it is. Uh, 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 a very special optical technique that can shape the light in 3D. So um, here I show a, a very a brief uh, diagram. So we have the light coming uh, on, on the left-hand side, and then we, we use a very special uh, device called spatial light modulator so that it can modulate the uh, uh, wavefront of the, of the light. And then after lens, we will be able to Right, uh, illuminate the object in some type of structure of light. So here, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the the light structure here can be in some specific, uh, some user-defined 3D shape. So on the bottom, we show that by 
by modulating this spatial light modulator, we will be able to change the, the, the projected light onto the uh, uh, object domain. So here is one, one spot, and then um, we can change the, the, the phase pattern on the spatial light modulator, and then we can do different uh, uh, light, uh, light projection onto, onto the object. So for example, here is uh, multiple spots. So what we really want to do is that doing the volumetric imaging, we can simultaneously do holographic optogenetic. So shown here on the left uh, uh, image, so we have two different laser, as I mentioned earlier. One is to uh, imaging the neuronal activity uh, in a volumetric approach. And the other one is to actuate the uh, holographic uh, optogenetic so that we can pick a group of new one and then modulate its activity. So um, here we show a quick cartoon to demonstrate that indeed we can project the light into the uh, 3D volume. So uh, we have a side camera to look at the phantom sample. So our sound is X direction vertical is the actual direction. So here we, we, we saw that by changing the um, phase pattern on the spatial line modulator, we will be able to project different patterns onto this 3D volume. And then imagine that each spot can be a new one. We will be able to activate or silence its activity. And then um, furthermore, on the right-hand side, we saw another uh, uh, right, uh, 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 phantom demonstration that we, we holographically uh, like pattern 100 spots on a 3D uh, sample on a 3D uh, uh, phantom sample, uh, and then we'll be able to write the information on different depths, right? Different pattern, and this is user defined, and then different prints, they do not have cross talk with each other, uh, showing a good uh, uh, actual resolution. So, this is uh, a quick overview of holographic uh, optogenetics. And then uh, in the following, I would like to show some uh, biological demonstration here. So, shown here, it is again a three different uh, uh, imaging plane on the mouse visual cortex. Um, and then for each plane, we do an imaging first. And then uh, by doing the imaging, we will be able to find out the neuronal map of each individual plane. So in red color, green color, and blue color here. Uh, and then afterwards that we can pick the neuron that we want to photo activate it. And then we encode that into the spatial line modulator. And then we'll be able to uh, uh, right, uh, photo stimulate them simultaneously. So shown here, it is some example. So for example, the first uh, specific uh, photo stimulation activation experiment is that we, we, we pick three different new ones, one from each plane, and then we photo activate that. And then once we photo activate, we see that the, the uh, fluorescence will uh, increase, uh, meaning that the specific new one is being activated. And then we can change this uh, pattern to activate different group of new ones. So here is showing a very simple demonstration showing three tar targets activation, and then we have light target and 27 targets shown here. And by the end, we were able to do more than uh, 50 uh, target new ones simultaneously in, in our um, demonstration here. And then um, another demonstration I would like to show you is that uh, using the same system, uh, we can not only uh, activate the nuance activity, but we can also do the silencing. We can also do the silencing. So uh, here we express the um, magnetic uh, ion channel that, that is called the option into the interneurons. So when we activate this interneuron, this interneuron will activate the pyramidal cells. So those are excitatory cells. And then uh, because of this, um, I mean, when we activate the uh, uh, interneuron, they, this interneuron will actually in inhibit, I'm sorry, so in inhibit the neuronal activity of the primal cell. So in this way, we can silence the, um, uh, the silence the activity of the primal cell. So shown here is one specific uh, demonstration. So we, we present a, a visual stimulation to the animal. Um, and then uh, every, 20, uh, every 20 seconds, we present two seconds of uh, uh, 
uh, visual stimulation, and then we will be able to find out there's some specific new one that is responding to that photo stimulation. For example, shown in this specific example, this new one will be uh, uh, responsive to the horizontal uh, grating. And then the other uh, pyramidal cell will be responding to another type of visual stimulation pattern. Um, and then the one below it is the interview new one. And then, so in the following, during the visual stimulation, we simultaneously activate a group of interview ones. We simultaneously activate a group of interview ones. So this is one specific interview one. We show that when every time that we photo stimulated, the calcium activity will go up. So uh, meaning that that interview one is activated. And then we look back at the same uh, pyramidal cells that originally is responding to the visual stimulation. Now, during the visual stimulation, all those activity is more or less abolished, meaning that that specific new one is uh, 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 silenced by, by, this, uh, in, uh, uh, by the activity of this uh, in the new one. And it's the same for the other group of new one. So uh, on the right hand side, we show that uh, statistically, if we fully stimulate the the interview new one, the interview one activity will increase and corresponding because of that increased activity of the interview one, it will inhibit the uh, activity of the adjacent uh, pyramidal cells. So showing in the middle panel and the bottom panel, we can see that the activity go to the negative region. So this shows that we can also do silencing through the same uh, system. And of course, there are some specific options that is uh, when we photo activate that, it will also silence the activity of the target new one. So uh, that's some other types of uh, options. So uh, I would also like to um, take this opportunity to, to uh, briefly go over that there's some uh, other action with results among the other group that is in the uh, holographic optogenetic uh, uh, area. So, uh, so shown here on the left is from the Michael Hoyce's labs that um, they developed a technique called closed loops control of neural activity in the real time. So basically is that depending on the activity of a specific new one, uh, that uh, depending on that, they can do the real time triggering uh, of the activity of the other new one through uh, optogenetic. And through this, they are hoping to induce the neuronal plasticity. And then there's also other development that develop uh, more uh, sensitive and um, optogenetic actuators. So for example, in Gilnell's assistance uh, labs that they uh, develop a very uh, uh, sensitive um, uh, op options and then uh, they can do um, uh, 300, 400 uh, new ones activation simultaneously. So this is really uh, pushing the optogenetic uh, technique to, to the new frontier. And uh, there's uh, also some other uh, application of optogenetic in, instead of in the in the brain, uh, that um, uh, that can also be used in the retina to map the functional connectivity. So, for example, in Valentina uh, and Mignani's labs, that they they use the same holographic uh, system that originally applied for, for for the brain, but now they apply that for the retina to do the functional uh, connectivity mapping. Okay, so. Um, in the last uh, about uh, 10 minutes also, I would like to discuss that using the imaging techniques uh, that we can map the neuronal uh, uh, structure and then using the holographic uh, optogenetic technique, we can modulate the group of neuronal activity. So using these two uh, techniques, we will be able to do some interesting neuroscience uh, investigation. Uh, so in the following, I would like to show you two examples. The first one is to, trigger the annual behavior and the other one is to program the neural activity. So the first example here is that we want to see whether there is a causal relationship between the activity in the mouse visual cortex and the uh, animal's behavior. So again, we present a visual discrimination task to the animal, but this uh, specific task is, uh, is uh, simple, it's called go, no go. So whenever the animal see this vertical grating here, that they will uh, connect the water with wall. And when they see the horizontal uh, grating, that there's no water with wall and they shouldn't leak to the water spout. 
uh, if they leak, then there will be some noise um, sound that come out as a penalty. So um, now we change the animal and then we show that. So after five to 10 days, uh, when we present the gold cubes to the animal, then the animal will reliably leak to the water spout. So it has a high performance. And then correspondingly, we do imaging in the visual cortex. And then we saw that there's a group of new ones that have activity. So uh, this show, shows that our, our uh, animal behavior task paradigm works out. So notice that this is the normal contrast or normal high contrast of the uh, visual uh, 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 stimulation. And then when we reduce the contrast of this visual stimulation uh, on the LCD monitor, that we will see that the animal performance drops. So I think that is easy to understand because the animal could get a little bit confused. The contrast of display is lower. And correspondingly on the visual cortex, the neuron that respond to the visual, uh, um, this, uh, visual stimulation the number of new one will also drop and then the activity drops. So showing the middle uh, panel. And then on the right hand side, we show that by using holographic optogenetic by photostimulate, uh, actually two new ones uh, simultaneously during this low contrast uh, condition, we'll be able to rescue the animal's uh, uh, task performance and correspondingly on the uh, visual we will also see that there's other neurons uh, that uh, belong to this uh, goal ensemble that have uh, activity. So we, we cover those uh, activity. So in summary, that we show that activation of a few core neurons in the neuronal ensemble that belong to the goal cubes. Uh, by doing that, we'll be able to trigger uh, the activity of the other uh, ensemble uh, members in the same uh, on a go go kill ensemble, and then by doing that, the task performance is enhanced. So this is really um, a, a demonstration to to show a causal relationship of the neuronal activity on the on the brain and the animal's behavior. And then we saw that by just photostimulates uh, two new ones that we will be able to trigger the other. Uh, new ones activity within the same whole cube ensemble, and then we recover the uh, animal's uh, uh, task performance. So uh, here, let's go into a little bit more detail of this. So the uh, panning completion. So first of all, we will need to do imaging first, so that uh, we can find out the neuronal activity during the whole cube. And then we, we use a probabilistic graph uh, that can um, to, to model the neural uh, network based on their activity. And then we find out the important new ones. So we call that the hub. That's th those hubs, uh, per simply, they will have stronger connectivity with other uh, new ones within the same ensemble. And then we go ahead to photo activate those uh, uh, pattern compression new ones during the uh, low contrast visual stimulation. And then we observe uh, the uh, animal behavior uh, task performance enhanced. So shown here is more a uh, little bit more detail of the data. So vertical axis shows that the number of new ones that is activated uh, during the low contrast visual stimulation. So um, for example, here in this particular case is a, is a relatively small number. And then when we do the uh, uh, photo stimulation of the so-called pattern compression new one, those two new ones, we can significantly enhance the number of new ones that is activated during the low contrast visual stimulation. Uh, and then if on the other hand, if we just randomly pick another two new ones within the uh, goal ensemble, that the performance of the animals will not be enhanced. And then also the uh, uh, activation of the other new one will not happen. So this demonstrates that we do really what 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 to select a specific uh, uh, new one, and this shows that the, the successful trial. And for those trials that the animal uh, fail, uh, meaning that they, they they fail to leak to the water spout, even though there's a gold cube, that we we still see that by activating the uh, panel completion new ones, the 
uh, overall activity of the gold uh, on sample will also increase, but it, it, it doesn't increase to a sense that uh, it's uh, able to uh, make a successful uh, uh, leak. Uh, so and if we look at the uh, correlation of the gold ensemble, we also see that uh, during the photo activation of the pattern completion new ones, the correlation with the gold ensemble will increase. Uh, so uh, I, by the end, we see that uh, by doing the pattern uh, completion new ones uh, uh, activation, we see the annual performance increase. So um, uh, on the other hand, if we, uh, if we uh, went them to pick a, a group of new new one to photo stimulate uh, during the uh, gold cubed or visual stimulation, we saw that this actually uh, served as a noise to the to 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 the visual cortex, and then correspondingly, the number of gold ensemble new one will decrease, and then the past performance will also jobs. So this really shows that bi-directional control of the task performing. If we fully stimulate the correct new one, that's uh, something nice will happen, but otherwise that we inject the noise into the brain and then it will disturb the original neural network and that will drop the animal's performance. Uh, so finally, in the last uh, few minutes, I would like to show you another uh, uh, research that uh, we, we try to program the neural network. So, um, so this is uh, uh, motivated by the Hepburn theory that if the new one fire together, that they will wire together. So we're thinking that if we use a uh, optogenetic approach to activate a group of new ones for a prolonged period, that they have uh, co-activation together, then whether they the underlying uh, functional connectivity can be can be strengthened. So that is the original motivation. And then indeed this could, could work out. So shown on the bottom, it is a diagram that um, of the original neural network. So in this cartoon, we say that these three new ones have a, a strong connectivity. And then when we photo stimulate the new one uh, here, that not only this new one will have activity, but because the other new one, the two new ones here also have strong connection with the the one that we, we photo stimulate. So these two new ones will also have activity, right? So this is the original uh, neural network. And then when we do the photo stimulations, uh, our population photo stimulation, so we photo stimulate a group of new ones uh, together for a long time. And then afterwards, afterwards that we, we go back to the same new one and then we just photo stimulate the same new one here. Then we see that there's more new one that is being activated. So this presumably means that uh, the uh, 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 underlying connectivity could be strengthened, but this is just one hypothesis. But now the, the, the mass we, we, we can reliably say that we create a new ensemble, right? So, um, and then shown here is that uh, we further analyze the cross correlation of the activity of the non photostimulant cells. So before, for the population for estimation after uh, their cross correlation stay the same overall for both day one and day two. But for those uh, new ones that is being photo stimulated, and then we we investigate their uh, correlation uh, uh, before and after, and then we see that after population for estimation their cross correlation does increase, so showing that they they they, they form a new ensemble, and this can can last for day two. So with an in vitro experiment su suggests that the, the, the mechanism of this uh, new ensemble creation uh, is probably not due to the um, uh, 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 synaptic strengthening, uh, uh, not due, due to happy and passivity, but more pointing to the neuronal excitability increase after photo stimulation. So meaning that the uh, spiking threshold could reduce. So this could facilitate the creation of new ensemble. So, um, and then um, nevertheless, uh, regardless of the mechanisms that uh, we still need to further look into, that this type, type of experiment point to, point to the uh, uh, conclusion that uh, we, we can use uh, optogenetic uh, approach uh, to potentially reprogram the neural network and then uh, 
it can be used to repair the neural network or maybe to cure the mental diseases. Uh, assuming that we know which new one that we want to photo activate. So in summary, uh, I would like to um, uh, uh, we emphasize that uh, two photon microscope with holographic optogenetics, it can uh, enable simultaneous read and write neuronal activity over a large population with cellular resolution. So it's very precise in cellular resolution and it's a powerful tool to dissect the neuronal circuit uh, in fundamental science. And it also opened a new and precise avenue to modulate the neural network and behavior. So uh, I would like to acknowledge that uh, 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 some of the work, particularly the, the uh, animal experiments uh, is uh, uh, in collaboration with uh, my colleague uh, back into the uh, uh, Columbia University in the UC lab. And I would also like to thank Panensky lab for the support. So uh, our current research now uh, is lying in uh, uh, the continued development of optical imaging and manipulations. And using this, we try to investigate the neural circuit and neural plasticity. So we hope to use this optical uh, uh, or optical uh, platform to investigate the neural circuit and use machine learning approach to understand the underlying uh, uh, network uh, uh, structure and then to understand how the brain works. And then as I'm in the engineering department, we hope that using the knowledge gained from neuroscience, we can also develop a better computational algorithms and better neuromorphic chip and better artificial intelligence. Um, so I would like to acknowledge my funding support, NIH, NSF, and the World's Welcome Fund. And I would like to uh, conclude with um, Dr. Cindy uh, Bradner's uh, famous product, Progress in science depends on new techniques, new development, uh, new discovery, and new idea properly in that order. So we are in the engineering department. We hope to develop advanced tools and then apply for the neuroscience research. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Wei Zhang. This was like a whirlwind tour through your technologies. Um, I really have to appreciate how far we have come. Um, when I was an active scientist, I worked probably with the first generation of two photon microscopy. And at that stage, we could see the potential, but many of these developments were not fully evolved at the stage. And I remember um, at one stage, we did some kind of brainstorming where people came up with, what would you do if you could? Um, and um, people came up with several of the ideas that you were presenting here. And at that stage, they were dismissed. Come on, this is not science. This is science fiction. But in the meantime, I see you are doing it on a regular basis. That, that's, that's most fascinating. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh -huh. um, what I see here is, in the meantime, um, the audience has added their first questions. Um, some of them can probably be um, put together. I will start with one that's probably a very simple, straightforward question. Someone asks, um, how deep can you image with your two photon system? Right. So the two photon system, currently we can image to about 600 to 700 micron into the brain. Uh, so uh, from, for the mouse visual cortex or other cortical area is, is probably enough, but certainly we, um, we are also looking into the tools that can further uh, uh, like going deeper into the brain. So uh, one particular tool is called three, three photon microscope developed by Chris Shree's group in Cornell University. So uh, for that one, uh, it is possible to image up to about 1.5 to 1.8 millimeter uh, into the brain. So uh, that's actually an ideal tool to, uh, to, to, to investigate right, subcortical structures such as hippocampus, for example. Um, and then uh, if we do want to uh, image a deeper, deeper brain structure, that uh, one possibility is to develop some miniaturized optics, uh, but that is training off the damage of some superficial uh, uh, 
uh, superficial tissue that we can implant, implant those mean trial optics in, into the deep brain structure and then to do uh, imaging and photo stimulation there. But certainly there's some trade off. And then the overall view is still trying to push that non invasively how deep <laughs> we can really go. And perhaps we can use some other multimodal approach such as uh, ultrasound and, and some some uh, some other uh, relevant techniques that can uh, complement the optical imaging. Yeah. Thank you. Um, here's a question that is more to the first part of your talk. Um, do the different lambdas have different resolutions? And yes. Um, if yes, does it matter? Yeah. So uh, lambda here, I uh, presumably it means that optical. Wavelength. So yes, in, indeed, the optical resolution is proportional to the uh, optical wavelength. So for the two photon uh, imaging here, uh, for the green channel, we use 920 nanometer. Uh, for the red channel, we use 1064 nanometer. So in terms of the absolute value is different by about 10 to 15 percent. But now the, the next uh, optical resolution for each spot there, it is on the order of like one micron scale. And then we are mainly interested in the neuronal uh, cell body. I'm sorry, the worm starts to turn off the lights. So, okay. Uh, then um, the neuronal cell body in the mouse is about like 10 micron, 15 micron in diameter. So that our resolution, whether it's one micron or 1.2, 1.3 micron, uh, doesn't matter too much for that particular application. <coughs> Um, which virus in, in the first part of your talk um, that was used for um, living functional cell imaging, not optogenetics, um, which virus did you use? Yeah, so we used uh, GCAM6. So uh, it is a West, uh, uh, it's a called uh, genetically encoded calcium indicator. So uh, it's GCAM6. And nowadays there's uh, some other new variants such as GCAM7, GCAM8, mm. and that will in enhance the uh, uh, light, uh, the imaging sensitivity. So meaning that for the same neural uh, 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 spiking events, there will be a larger change of the uh, uh, fluorescence uh, uh, strength so that we will be able to uh, uh, enhance the sensitivity. Yeah, so that is the first part. For the second part, uh, we use uh, 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 options it's called C1, V1, V1 uh, uh, variant of China World Epsin 2. So it is uh, West shifted. So, um, yeah, so it is uh, the excitation uh, uh, wavelength will need to be different from the G camp. So that when we do imaging, we are not like st stimulate the, the option simultaneously so that we can bring in another laser which has a longer wavelength to just photo stimulate a specific uh, group of neurons that we pick out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there was a follow-up question from the same um, participant. Did you use Cal light? Uh, Cal, uh, so we we do not. So we use a calcium indicator. Yeah. Okay. Um, a straightforward question here is: um, Which device did you use to capture the op optical images? So we use a uh, two photon mi microscope, and then there's a specific device called photo multi type uh, tubes, PMT. So it is very sensitive uh, uh, optical sensing device that we, we can use that to sense a very weak fluorescence coming out from the brain. Uh, and then uh, if we uh, might, uh, might do the data processing on that so that we can correlate the uh, temporal uh, signal from the PMT with the scanning trajectory of the two photon laser so that we will be able to build the uh, uh, imaging uh, pixel by pixel, for example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here's a question about your interneuron stimulation. Um, which types of interneurons did you target with this protocol? Um, the question I'm is, wondering because there's such a diversity of um, interneurons and they may have different intrinsic properties. Yes, um, yes. Can you yes. separate them? Yeah, so uh, uh, in, in the specific 
protocol that we, we use there, we photostimulate a interneural, a subset, subtype of interneural called SHOM cell. And there's actually many different types of uh, uh, interneural as the audience mentioned, there's PV cell and uh, VIP cell, uh, SHOM cell specifically. Mm -hmm. And then how do we separate that is that we <coughs> use genetically uh, approach so that the virus is only express the option in that specific uh, cell types so that we know that uh, uh, if we, so, we know that the the the, the, the cell that we are photosynthesizing is is the one that we want. For example, SOM cell, S O M, uh, in in uh, the protocol that I showed earlier. Mm -hmm. So, then here's one last question for you. Mm -hmm. um, is this applicable for larger animal models? The questioner asks, perhaps dogs or even non-human primates. Yeah, so I would say that uh, specifically for um, for the uh, imaging technique is certainly being uh, applied for larger animal models, for example, non-human uh, primate, either under a head fixed condition or the head, head can, can move using an optical endoscope. So uh, that's certainly true for, for imaging. And then the same is also being uh, uh, applied for the optogenetics as well. Yes, so that is certainly uh, being implemented at this moment. I'm not sure about dogs though, but uh, certainly for uh, non-human primates, it's currently being uh, applied, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Wei Zhang, thank you very much. Um, thank you for an outstanding talk. And um, also thank you for being on time because um, we are exactly, this is now uh, 10 o'clock in California. And um, so this is, precision work in, in all dimensions. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, when I first saw um, all our participants today, I thought this is an all California event. And um, Mikhail is definitely from, uh, uh, he's based in California at the moment, but at at this very present moment, he is in Venice in Italy, um, so which is a bit of a time um, delay. Um, but anyway, we are grateful for Mikhail to join us. Um, he is from Caltech, and um, again, he is um, associated with two departments there, um, chemical engineering, and I recently heard that you're also director of the Center for Molecular and Cellular Medicine. That's quite a mouthful. Um, Michal's talk is talking to neurons with ultrasound. So please, Michal. Great. Uh, well, thank you very much uh, to Peter and Jan for inviting me to be part of this uh, panel. Uh, it's really um, a pleasure and, and very exciting, in fact, um, to be here. Uh, with you. Um, and uh, let's see if everything, hopefully everything will go very smoothly. But as Peter mentioned, I am I am currently in Venice for the International Ultrasound Symposium. Uh, so if there are connection issues, I hope somebody will pop up um, and let me know, but hopefully it'll be okay. So uh, by way of introduction, in, in our lab, we develop technologies to image and control the function of cells deep inside the body. And this is important for uh, neuroscience. If we wanna know how neurons work, we need to see them within the in vivo context. Uh, the same is true for microbes in the gut, immune cells and cancer cells fighting each other elsewhere in the body. In all these cases, we wanna see and control the function of these cells within their um, uh, natural in vivo context. And in addition, we and others are interested in developing cells as therapeutic agents with so things like CAR T cells and regenerative medicine, where I think it's going to be important um, after we put these cells into patients uh, to have good ways to see where they are and what they're doing. And ideally also to tell them what to do based on their uh, spatial location. Now, doing this today uh, in vivo in deep tissues is quite challenging because if you think about the best technologies we have available for imaging and controlling cell function, and we, we heard beautiful examples of this in the previous talk, they're mostly based on light, right? Things like fluorescent proteins and optogenetics, which derive a lot of their power from the fact that they're genetically encodable. So we have very good ways to plug them in intimately to specific cell types um, and interact with them. But it's challenging to scale light uh, up to large organisms, even relatively small ones like mice, as we were just talking about, you get penetration depths of a few hundred microns, but it's it's hard to scale them 
beyond that. So we need some alternatives. Um, and in fact, there are technologies like ultrasound and um, uh, magnetic resonance that use penetrant forms of energy. Sound waves and magnetic fields can go in and out of the body uh, much more easily. And so you get these beautiful images of the human fetus or the human brain uh, with these techniques. But historically, these techniques Technologies have not been connected uh, as well to what happens at the cellular level. So that's the gap that we're trying to bridge with our research. And we do that by taking these technologies, taking their physics, and extending their capabilities to the cellular level um, through biomolecular engineering, where we evolve, we engineer, uh, we design uh, proteins and other genetically encodable materials that have the right properties to, instead of interacting with light, uh, to interact with sound waves and magnetic fields. And the work in our lab pretty much breaks down along those lines of sound waves, magnetic fields, and imaging and control. Um, now, for today's talk, I'm gonna focus completely on what we're doing with sound waves. Um, and I'm gonna spend the first part talking about imaging, and I'm gonna um, spend the second part of the talk uh, talking about control. And some of it you'll see, you'll see uses biomolecules that we're engineering designing, uh, and some of it uses endogenous things that are already present um, inside the body. So why do we love ultrasound? Well, it's it's a great combination of simplicity and uh, performance. So simplicity in the sense that it's just based on sound wave that we transmit it into a tissue. Um, and in the case of imaging, what's happening is that the sound wave gets reflected or scattered off of interfaces that have a different density or stiffness like bone versus muscle. And based on the time of flight between emitting and receiving the echo, we can tell how deep that interface is. And then we can scan the beam left and right and generate an image like this one here. And you can tell right away that ultrasound can go deep, right? This is tens of centimeter um, into the body. Um, what may be harder to appreciate from kind of fetal ultrasound images is that it's a high performance technique. So routinely in our lab without any special tricks and using conventional equipment, we get spatial resolution that's better than about hundred microns. Uh, centimeters deep in the tissue, uh, which is not single cell, but it is at the level that many uh, aspects of biology are organized. It's very fast. Um, we can get temporal resolution below a millisecond. And recently there have been breathtaking advances in ultrasound, like the development of super resolution ultrasound that uses uh, stochastic signal principles analogous to the ones um, used in some of the optical super resolution uh, microscopy techniques, where this is an example of a live rat where the microvasculature in its brain, brain, brain wide is being resolved at better than 10 microns spatial resolution. So they're really amazing advances happening on the imaging side with ultrasound. And at the same time, ultrasound can manipulate activity because you can focus an ultrasound beam the same way that you can focus light. And now at that focus, you can apply force or you can deposit energy. So that allows you to push on things or heat things up. And that's already used clinically uh, for example, to, to ablate um, uterine fibroids in this example, or the subthalamic nucleus in this, in this example. But um, there's a lot of interest in employing this in a not destructive way, but to manipulate <clears throat> activity, for example, of the brain. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that uh, during this presentation. So I'm going to start with the imaging. And I'm going to talk about, first of all, a technology that um, was invented uh, about a decade ago by Mikhail Tanter and colleagues um, in Paris. Um, that allows ultrasound to image brain activity by looking at blood flow. Okay, and the way this works is that it's using Doppler ultrasound, which means that we're sending in a sound wave, we're receiving it, and red blood cells that are moving through our image will shift the frequency of the ultrasound through the Doppler effect. Okay, and so using that, um, and I'm, I'm kind of glossing over a lot of details, but roughly through that mechanism, we can tell when we have moving blood cells within a region of our image. And when we want to connect that to neural activity, we look for increases in the amount of red blood cells that are moving through a particular voxel, three-dimensional pixel in our image. And uh, Mikhail and colleagues showed that you could use this to follow neural activity. So this was this breathtaking result uh, from published in 2011, showing that this is in a, in a live rat uh, following the propagation of a seizure uh, throughout this brain. And uh, the, the idea is that you have neural activity that then leads to changes in blood flow that then leads to changes in ultrasound uh, um, signal. And the, the key, very nice thing, several nice things about ultrasound compared to, for example, fMRI as another hemodynamic technique is that, first of all, the spatial resolution is better. It's about 100 microns, whereas, whereas with fMRI, 
practically speaking, it's it's hard to get below um, half a millimeter. And so volumetrically, that makes makes a big difference. Um, the temporal resolution is quite fast, about 100 milliseconds uh, for getting these kind of signals. And unlike MRI, where you're required to put the animal or subject into this giant scanner and they can't move, otherwise you're going to ruin the image, with ultrasound, you can actually do this in awake behaving ambulatory animals, as I'll show in the next slide. And so this um, created a whole beautiful field, uh, field of work that many groups um, in France, outside of France, now in the US, as I'll show you, are, are, are doing um, using functional ultrasound in a variety of, of species, um, in humans, uh, for clinical applications, for basic uh, applications, et cetera. Um, you know, there's a beautiful example of imaging through the fontanelle in, um, in, uh, in children. Uh, to non-invasively provide access and see seizures. And this is an example of a uh, rat, hopefully the video is playing okay over Zoom, where the animal is moving around, right? It's, be it's behaving, it's running around. It has a head-mounted ultrasound probe where the imaging is happening in real time uh, in the brain. And so we got very excited about this technology at Caltech. And we said, could this possibly be used for possibly be used for brain machine interfaces. And um, so this is a, a project that's a collaboration with Richard Anderson, who has for a long time been, been using electrode-based brain machine interfaces. But we thought if we could if we could do this with ultrasound, meaning can we have ultrasound read out movement intentions um, that that might, might enable us to provide a less invasive approach where we probably still have to remove a part of the skull to give ultrasound access with high resolution, but we don't have to penetrate the dura. We don't have to stick anything into the brain. So it could be a much less invasive procedure. So the question was, can we get enough information using this hemodynamic technique uh, to actually make sense of what the movement intentions are in an animal? So we did this uh, in non-human primates. Um, here are the regions that we were looking at with ultrasound. Here are some example ultrasound images. This is volumetric where we're taking an ultrasound probe and we're scanning it um, so we can get this kind of volumetric image. And then this is what an example cross-section looks like. Okay, And so now we're looking at changes in blood flow while the animal is performing a task. And in, in uh, one of the tasks we did, we had the non-human primate uh, fi fixate on a dot. Um, and then we present the cue either to the right or to the left. The cue goes away. There's a memory period during which the animal is planning the movement of its eyes in this case. And we'll see later an example with, with hand as well. And then it executes that movement. And what we're trying to do is to see whether during this memory period, we can tell from the ultrasound signals which way the movement um, is going to go. This is what the activation looks like. So that within this region that we're looking at, we can, we can tell that there are regions that are tuned to one of the directions, right or left. And so here's an example from one of these little patches where you can see if you have a right cue versus the left cue, you see this big difference that's occurring during the memory period. So this is looking at intentions. This is before the animal is, is executing um, any kind of movement. And so we looked at this and said, all right, there's a big, a big change here. Um, maybe we can use the information contained within uh, these images to decode um, intended movement. And so that uh, went through a pipeline that we created where we're acquiring these images, we're creating a training set that's building the connection between direction of movement um, and the um, uh, spatial temporal pattern of activity that we see. And we use linear decoding methods uh, at that point uh, to try to separate these classes and build, and build the predictor and then test how well it worked. And um, to our uh, surprise, honestly, and, and delight, we saw that we had very nice performance. So um, when we did saccade tasks with the eyes or reach tasks um, with the joystick, we had more than 80% and in some cases up to 90% uh, prediction accuracy. And this is, again, happening without sticking any electrodes uh, into the brain itself and looking at purely purely hemodynamic um, signals. And if you, if you then want to look and see kind of what parts of the brain were the most informative, in doing this, uh, we can create maps like this, and it actually maps to the regions that you expect to be. This uh, I forgot to mention. This is in the in the posterior parietal cortex, uh, which is a movement planning region um, of the brain. So we were delighted to see. Okay, we have this decoding, and this and this is just right now in in this data decoding left versus right. Okay, so we want to see if we could make it a little bit more complicated by creating an intermingled task where again we're instructing to move right or left, but we're also instructing whether to move the eyes or to move a joystick uh, with the hand. And we want to see whether we can tell which direction, which effector, eyes or hand, and 
detect when the movement is happening, movement or no movement. So now those are those are three different bits of information at the same time. And actually it worked pretty well. So this is a confusion matrix where we're looking at what really happened versus what we predicted. And everything that's on the diagonal is a correct prediction. So you can see the vast majority of our predictions are correct. And when it there is a mistake, it's a proximal mistake. Um, uh, and then this is what a, a time course looks like. So we can actually go through and we're not telling the decoder when the task is happening, it's decoding that uh, by itself. And so we can tell that, that the movement is happening. So go, no, go. We can classify whether it's going to be reach or saccade, and we can tell whether it's left versus right. And so, um, you know, we're quite, quite excited to see this. And so now this, um, you know, we published this uh, last year, and, and now this has created a pretty, I would say a significant research program where we're trying to see just how far we can push it, how much, how much decoding uh, can we get, um, and um, and how what kind of form factor we can make for these devices to potentially build a chronic um, interface. Now, what makes this possible? Because you know, certainly people have been able to do fMRI for for a couple of decades, and could do these some of these kind of tasks. You know, maybe with the eye movements and so on in scanners, and haven't been able to do this kind of um, this kind of decoding. And I think there, there are a couple of things. So one is uh, resolution. Um, so here we have a map of how accurate is our decoder, this color uh, scale, as a function of resolution. And up here in the top left corner, we have our you know, 100 micron spatial resolution, but then we can we can step that resolution down, right? So here we're decreasing resolution in Z and in the X direction. As you can see, when you decrease the resolution, by the time you get to, you know, half uh, a millimeter on each side, you're you're now below 60 percent in prediction accuracy. So it is actually important to be able to get this kind of resolution, and that just wasn't available with fMRI. And then the second thing is that this is a single trial phenomenon, right? You're trying to make prediction. What's happening? at that particular moment in time. So you can't really do averaging. Um, and typically with fMRI, because the signal levels, signal changes tend to be lower, uh, people end up averaging multiple presentations of a task uh, together. But with functional ultrasound, it's sufficiently sensitive that from a single trial, you can do um, analysis and decoding. So I think that's another great advantage of this technology that we're excited about. Now, I know that we have, uh, neuroscientists here um, and in the audience. And, um, uh, you know, it's very common that they say, oh, this is great, but it's hemodynamic. Um, could you ever get ultrasound to look at kind of more specific molecular signals? You know, can you look at neurons firing? And of course, our inspiration for this is the optical tools like GCAMP, which, you know, beautifully in, in this example, in larval zebrafish, um, and in the previous talk we saw, allow you to Look at neural activity much much more specifically in, in in specific cell types. So, could we ever do something like this with ultrasound? Because if we could, then we could look at the entire brain at the same time, rather than being limited to a couple hundred, you know, a few hundred microns in depth and relatively small um, areas. So, is there a G camp for ultrasound? But before we have a G camp, we need a GFP to build the GCAMP based on. And so just as there was a, a great breakthrough um, in going from synthetic fluorophores to ones that are genetically encoded when GFP was developed, similarly, there's a need for something like that to happen with ultrasound. And our version of, of uh, synthetic dyes are these contrast agents called microbubbles, which as the name suggests are micron-sized bubbles of gas. Um, and because they are um, less dense and more compressible than blood, or tissues, if you inject these bubbles into circulation, you can very nicely see blood vessels. And so in fact, this beautiful image I showed you earlier is based on injecting those micro bubbles into circulation. And they're used in the clinic to look at, to look at um, cardiovascular disease. Um, and so a question that we've been obsessed with in our lab for the last decade <clears throat> is whether we have something like this uh, um, that can be genetically encoded, that cells could make themselves, that can similarly scatter sound waves. And luckily for us, the answer turned out to be yes. And it, it came from organisms uh, similar to these ones. This, this is a picture of the South Bay salt ponds near San Francisco, where the color in these bodies of water comes from photosynthetic microbes that live in the water and have to um, access sunlight for photosynthesis, okay? And the way they do that is by forming these really beautiful intracellular self-assembled protein nanostructures called gas vesicles, okay? Intracellular self-assembled protein uh, nanostructures um, that 
uh, you can see one of these that we've isolated from a cyanobacterium and now looking at it on an EM grid. And you can see it's particles that are a couple hundred nanometers in size. And what's special about these protein nanostructures is that they're hollow on the inside and filled with gas. So we have a two nanometer thick shell that encloses this couple hundred nanometer compartment that does not allow any water to get inside, but allows gas molecules that are dissolved in the surrounding media to partition in and out. So typically the inside contents would be oxygen, nitrogen, um, and carbon dioxide. And um, when these cells wanna float higher, they turn on the genetic program that allows um, the, the formation of more gas vesicles, makes the cell less dense and allows it to float um, in the water. So really amazing piece of evolution. And then when the cell, if the cell wants to sink, they can dilute these with cell division or break them down with proteases um, and sink back down. And so we looked at these things and we said, all right, you have a protein that's filled with air. Maybe it'll be able to scatter sound waves so we can see this protein with ultrasound. And luckily that turned out um, to be true. Uh, and so this is from our first paper on this in 2014, where we showed that if we just take some of these gas vesicles, purify them from cyanobacteria and look at them under ultrasound, we can see contrast. So the images you're looking at here are hydrogels um, that are acoustically transparent. So that's the black background. And then within these gels, we've embedded different concentrations of our gas vesicles, and we're imaging them with ultrasound frequencies that are relevant for preclinical and clinical imaging. And we saw this nice contrast. So we were very excited about that. Um, and then of course, one of the first questions is, can you see it in vivo in a living, breathing animal? And so what we did initially is inject them into the vasculature and um, when you put um, nanoparticles of the size into the bloodstream, most of them are going to get cleared by the liver. And so initially we were just imaging the liver, which is outlined here uh, in, in mice. Um, and I'm going to start the video. And what we're going to see is that as we start the injection, the liver goes from being dark to accumulating contrast. And so this was exciting because to, to my knowledge, this is the first time that a biomolecule could be seen non-invasively with ultrasound inside of a living, uh, breathing uh, creature. And so this opened up a new field that uh, we call biomolecular ultrasound. And we've had a lot of fun over the last um, 10 years or so um, developing where it can go, right? So just like with fluorescent proteins, there were all these questions initially about why is it green and how do you make it blue? How do you make it more photostable? How does it fold in different cell types, et cetera? Um, we've had all the same kind of questions here, except we have the added complication that instead of a single gene, we're dealing with a group of genes that have to form to work together uh, to form these gas vesicles. And instead of quantum yields and extinction coefficients, we're dealing with nanomechanics of these structures because the, a sound wave is a pressure wave that's applying compression and rarefaction. And we have to understand how these proteins are deforming in that to help us design better ways to image them with ultrasound. And so I'm gonna give you um, just a couple highlights here and talk about the prospects of, of having a dynamic sensor um, using this technology, the, the GFP and, and GCAMP. Um, and so one of the biggest questions when we first <clears throat> came out with this technology was whether we would ever be able to express this in mammalian cells. Um, the reason this is considered challenging is because um, you know, nobody had really put such a complex operon transferred from prokaryotes into eukaryotes. And all of these genes have to um, be expressed and fold properly on their own. Some of these are structural proteins. Some of these are chaperones and assembly factors or minor constituents. And they all have to be at the right stoichiometry. They have to find each other inside the cell and assemble. And so there were people, uh, you know, including some reviewers and so on who said, yeah, this is, this is never gonna work in mammalian cells. But luckily uh, my students at Caltech are very courageous and they took on the problem and they succeeded. And so here I'm gonna summarize uh, four years of work with this little black arrow right here. And I apologize to all the students in the audience. Um, but uh, what we did is essentially take all these all the genes encoding gas vesicles, showed that we could get mammalian versions of them uh, put into a cell, make some gas vesicles, and then use the latest tricks of synthetic biology to string these genes together into mammalian polycystronic operons, multi-gene operons, where the genes are encoded at correct stoichiometry. And we really pushed the limits, like for example, using 2A elements, for those of you who are familiar with it, where you know we strung together not two or three proteins, but but like eight proteins together to make it work. And the upshot of this is that if you take these genes and you put them into the genome of mammalian cells, like hex cells here, you can form gas vesicles um, inside the cell. Uh, and so that was exciting. And, and of course, more importantly, now what that lets us do is to follow gene expression with ultrasound. So um, here we have um, just the, the simplest gene circuit we could construct, which is has our ARGs or acoustic reporter genes 
under the control of a doxycycline inducible promoter. And so now here we're looking at live mammalian cells that are embedded in hydrogel and we're um, uh, applying more an inducer and seeing an increase in ultrasound contrast. So now we're watching the dynamics of gene expression using ultrasound. Um, this is of course in vitro. And so we want to know what this looks like in vivo. And as our, as the first model, when we first did this, we wanted to look at subcutaneous tumors that we make in mice. And what's known about these tumors is that as they grow, they tend to be better vascularized in the perimeter than in the core. And so you would expect better gene expression of an inducible gene at that perimeter. And this is actually very difficult to see optically uh, because the light gets scattered, even though these tumors are, are fairly small. But what we're hoping is to see with ultrasound that we would have enhanced expression. And so what, what we're doing is um, creating these two tumors that are engineered genetically to express our acoustic reporter genes. And then we do ultrasound imaging. And what we see here in grayscale is the anatomical background. So we have the skin here, the tumor is located under the skin. And then in red scale is a nonlinear ultrasound signal that's coming specifically from our gas vesicles that are being formed inside the cell. And we see what looks kind of like this ring-like pattern of expression where it's bright towards the perimeter and there's a dark inner core. And then to confirm that this is actually reality, we can then section this tumor and look at it under fluorescence. <clears throat> and we see this uh, nice corresponding pattern of gene expression. And the difference uh, between right and left here is that on the right, we had to slice the animal into little pieces and put it under a microscope to see this pattern. Whereas on the left, the mouse is alive and well, and we can continue to follow the spatial and temporal dynamics um, of these uh, these tumors. So, um, <clears throat> So there's a, a lot more work and you know, I encourage people to check out publications from our lab on, on the basic reporter gene technology. But, but then the next question is, can we go beyond just gene expression and look at more dynamic signals? Um, so going towards this G-camp uh, for ultrasound. And what allows us to pursue this direction is some fundamental work we did connecting the protein composition of the gas vesicles with their mechanics and therefore their acoustic signal. And in particular, there's a protein called GVPC or gas vesicle protein C that sits on the outside of the gas vesicle shell and makes it more stiff. Okay, this is an alpha helical rod-like protein. There are multiple copies of it. So it stiffens the gas vesicle. And when you remove this protein, it makes the gas vesicle more flexible, okay? And we have, you know, we published a number of papers to support that here. I'm just giving you the, the high level picture. And so the idea is that when you have a stiff gas vesicle and you apply ultrasound, it doesn't deform very much. Whereas if you have a more flexible gas vesicle that undergoes these deformations that end up producing a special nonlinear ultrasound signal. And um, without going into a lot of detail, you have linear mode and nonlinear mode imaging. And only the gas vesicles where we have removed the GVPC show up in this nonlinear contrast, okay? So that's the connection we need to make, the presence of GVPC or absence of GVPC and turning on and off nonlinear signal. And the reason I'm, I'm telling you about this is because now this gives us a way to make biosensors. And the first time we did this, we made a biosensor of protease activity by engineering GVPC to have recognition motifs in it that can get cleaved by a specific protease. So if it's an endopeptidase, it'll make a cut in that rod, right? Make it less stiff. And we're hoping that it would make the gas vesicle more flexible. Or if you have a processive protease, can recognize the, recognize the end of a protein, that it can go and chew it up. Uh, and that in both of these cases, we were hoping we would get more flexible gas vesicles <clears throat> and thereby turn on nonlinear contrast. And indeed, after um, quite a bit of uh, optimization, um, figuring out where to put these cleavage sequences and so on, we have things that, that work. And so what we've published are, um, sensors of uh, viral TEV protease. So here, when we add the protease, we see the turning on of nonlinear signal. This is you know, happening live um, inside of, uh, in this case, being imaged inside of hydrogel. Um, this also works with, with the human uh, enzyme calpian, which is a calcium dependent uh, protease. So when we have calpian and calcium present, we see the turning on of signal. Also works with a processive <clears throat> um, proteasome-like um, protease from E. coli. This is clip XP, where, where we have this active enzyme, choose up the GBPC, and we see this night and day uh, turn on of difference. And so, um, so in principle, it is possible to have an acoustic protein that reacts to its environment, right? Just like people have done with many different things for fluorescent proteins. And so I just want to give you a teaser here. We're not ready to um, share a lot of details about this, but this, this is uh, work that you know, hopefully will, will come out um, sometime in the near future, is that we, we are indeed building the GCAM for ultrasound. And we're doing that by engineering proteins in the gas vesicle shell to respond to calcium. And unlike the protease example, this needs to be reversible. 
um, and dynamic. And so we've engineered <clears throat> um, the proteins so they can undergo reversible conformation changes that make the gas vesicle shell more flexible in response to calcium. Here is an example where we add calcium, we see an increase in signal. Then we chelate the calcium away with the EGTA, we see a decrease in signal. Um, and recently we've been able to do this intracellularly in hex cells with the completely genetically encoded uh, sensor. So still a lot more work to do on uh, kinetics and sensitivity and so on. Um, but I think, you know, we have something that, that, um, is going in the right direction and just, you know, remind everybody, you know, now people are using GCAMP seven, um, and GCAMP eight, uh, and, and the original, uh, chameleon, you know, didn't work super well. And so, you know, we're still at the, at the chameleon stage, but hopefully this gives us a path, a path forward to, to making, um, dynamic ultrasound sensors. So <clears throat> one of the cool things about ultrasound is that it's not just for imaging, as I mentioned in the introduction. And so, in fact, everything I told you about so far has been coming from just one regime of ultrasound where we're sending brief pings of sound. They're bouncing off, coming back and letting us form an image. Uh, but in fact, <clears throat> if you change the ultrasound parameters so you can focus the, the beam, you apply longer pulses, depending on the, the exact pulse parameters, you can push on things create acoustic radiation force, you can deposit energy and you can heat things up locally. And if you have bubbles that are present or, or you, you create, then you can cause um, cavitation, which can really unleash very strong mechanical effects uh, locally. And these are all um, used in, in clinic and, and in acoustic, uh, acoustic fluidic devices and so on. And so we've been very interested in connecting these to see whether we can manipulate cellular function. Um, and today I'm just gonna focus on our work with regard to doing this for the, uh, for the brain. And so there's a lot of interest out there in using ultrasound to modulate neural activity. And the reason for that is that with focused ultrasound, if you're using the right frequencies, you can actually make it completely non-invasive. You can even go through the human skull. In fact, that's used clinically for ablation, um, as I mentioned in the introduction. So ultrasound can go through the skull. It can have spatial precision that's on the order of millimeter, uh, which I think compares uh, quite favorably with deep brain stimulation. Um, and, um, it can, as I mentioned, produce mechanical or thermal effects. So you have something that's non-invasive and that unlike, let's say, TMS or TDCS is not surface focused, right? meaning you can actually focus the beams at depth at specific anatomical locations. So there's been a lot of interest in seeing, can we use ultrasound in a non-destructive regime to modulate um, neural activity? And the interest in this field is really awakened by uh, Jamie Tyler, um, although there was some some work like 60 years ago, but Jamie Tyler um, in in 20 around 2010 uh, showed that you can use low intensity ultrasound to activate um, neurons in mice and activate behavior in 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 mice and 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 rats. And so here's an example where you have an animal where ultrasound is being applied to its head. This is the tail here, and when you turn on the ultrasound, you see these movements. So you know here they're targeting the motor, motor cortex and they're seeing the tail flick and they're seeing cause flick, um, and then in and subsequent work, uh, people showed that you can do this in humans and you can elicit sensory effects, you know finger uh, sensations and so on. Um, and so this spawned a field. There's there's you know there's a recent um, functional um, focused ultrasound neuromodulation conference held in Germany where there, there were dozens of labs that that came and participated. So, but there is a mystery which is that nobody really understands how this works. Like, what is this low intensity ultrasound doing um, to activate uh, or inhibit um, neural activity? And I think if you don't understand the mechanism, it's hard as an engineer to really optimize it. Um, and I think the, fun, uh, the understanding is important for experimentalists. If you're doing neuroscience experiments with it, you, I think you really wanna know what is it doing to the neurons. Um, and the reason doing that is challenging is because as I mentioned, ultrasound can do all these different things. And it just so happens that the parameters that are, that are used in ultrasound neuromodulation could cause each of these effects, pushing, heating, or cavitation. So it's messy. It's not obvious right away which one of these is at play. And then how does it interact with cells at the molecular level? How does it interact with the brain at the tissue level? And so we've been very interested in this. And so we've, we've pursued it both at an organism level and at the cellular and molecular level. So I'm going to take a little bit of a, a deep dive in, in a few minutes um, into the cellular and molecular level where we've tried to dissect um, the pathways involved. And then if there's time, I'm going to say a little bit about our findings at the, at the organism level. So to, to understand how ultrasound is interacting with, with neurons at, at the 
by a physical level, um, we created a setup where we can do simultaneous um, optical imaging. So this is imaging G camp, and you see we also image voltage of neurons that are growing on an acoustically transparent material, mylar, and are submerged in the water tank so that we can use a focused ultrasound transducer to apply ultrasound um, to these neurons. So the key thing here is that they're in an uh, acoustically realistic condition. Everything is soft. There are no hard materials, no pipettes, no electrodes there that sound waves would otherwise interact with. So it's a similar conditions to what you would, would have in the brain. And we're doing an all optical readout from these neurons. So then we apply ultrasound uh, using parameters that are similar to what people use in vivo. And this is the kind of activation that we see. So there's some spontaneous activity. And then we, when we apply ultrasound, we see the uh, neurons within the field of view lighting up. So that works quite consistently. And we see these nice uh, G-CAMP responses. So ultrasound does directly activate um, the neurons. And so, you know, how does that, how does that happen? So first of all, um, it's scalable. So as we increase the intensity, or increase the pulse duration of the ultrasound. This is in the hundreds of milliseconds, we see increased um, activation levels. Um, it doesn't just happen when the neurons are on a substrate and surrounded by liquid. You can also have the neurons in collagen and activate them there. So you see this uh, these activation patterns. So it's something that um, seems to happen to the neurons in, in a way that is not super dependent on the context. They can be on a substrate or they can be in a, in, embedded in a, in a collagen um, gel that's similar to extracellular matrix. Um, you um, have these interesting dynamics here. So the ultrasound is being turned on, is being kept on in this example for about 500 milliseconds, and you don't get a response right away. There's a delay in when the response happens of, of uh, on the order of 100 milliseconds. Um, and um, we can quantify that and see that that delay is reduced as you go to higher intensities of ultrasound. Um, and uh, as you go to higher intensity, you also delay the time to peak. But the, key, the one key thing here is that there's a little bit of delay and then it persists for a couple of seconds um, afterwards. Um, this is not happening because ultrasound is damaging the neurons. We can tell that calcium currents return to at these uh, parameters. And so what are the physical phenomena involved? As I mentioned, it could be heating. Um, there have been hypotheses about bubble formation and cavitation. It could be mechanical force. And so we took a stab at, at trying to disentangle these uh, from each other. So we find that it's not temperature. We actually use a fiber, very precise fiber thermometer to measure the temperature elevations. And you can see it's you know small fractions of a degree. So not enough to really activate um, uh, receptors. We can also follow the uh, a fluorophore M cherry, which has a temperature dependence, and see that it's pretty flat in terms of its its response. So it's not it's not temperature. Um, there is also a proposal that it could be cavitation. So there are these theories called the bilayer sonophore model, where there may be bubbles that are inside the mem the lipid bilayer that are forming under ultrasound, and that their expansion is changing the capacitance of the electrical capacitance of the bilayer, and thereby leading to charge accumulation, which can then lead to excitation. So beautiful um, theoretical model, but um, you know we wanted to see if we could find some kind of evidence to support it. And so one way to to do that is to bias the formation of bubbles for or against it. Uh, by degassing the media. If you have less gas in the media, it makes it more challenging for the bubbles to form. And when we do that, we don't really see a big difference. So no evidence of, of cavitation being involved from this experiment, but we weren't satisfied with that. We also wanted to try to you know, see it directly. And so we borrowed a 5 million frame per second camera um, from our aeronautics department and tried to see during the ultrasound cycle, do you actually see any kind of index of refraction changes in, in the membrane or any evidence of bubbles forming? And the short answer is that we didn't. Um, and so uh, from this, we don't see really evidence of cavitation. So the last thing is mechanical, that there's some kind of um, mechanical force. Um, and the force is very subtle. So when we, when we, again, we use our high speed camera, or in this case, we use the low speed camera, we don't actually see big deformations of the neurons or anything like that. So whatever, whatever mechanical phenomena are at play likely are happening at more of a na the nanoscale that we can't resolve with the techniques that we were using in this, in this study. But we do have some evidence that it's mechanical because if you change the mechanics of the cell, for example, by de depolymerizing its cytoskeleton with cytokalicin, uh, you do see a, a significant drop in 
um, the response to ultrasound. And for all the perturbations I'm showing in this slide and in subsequent ones, we always make sure that we're using doses that do not perturb the spontaneous neural activity. So it's not like we're just making the neurons unhealthy. So these are specific effects that are reducing the responsiveness to ultrasound. So the key on this slide is that it might be mechanical because we're changing the mechanics of the cytoskeleton and that's changing our ultrasound uh, response. And it seems to be something that is intrinsic to each neuron, meaning synaptic transmission is not required. When we block it with CNQX and AP5, we don't see a decrease um, in, in, in the response. Um, and the calcium that comes in, right, we're using GCAMP to look at this, is only partially coming in through action potentials, uh, meaning that if we block action potentials by blocking sodium channels with TTX, we still see some calcium, um, uh, some calcium coming in. So it's likely that the calcium um, comes in as part of the initial response. So whatever molecules, uh, ion channels are responding to the ultrasound have calcium uh, permeability. And this calcium is primarily coming from outside the cell. So when we compare looking at uh, scenarios where we have both extracellular calcium and endoplasmic reticulum uh, calcium stores present, you see this big response. If you remove the extracellular calcium, you kill almost all of the response. You still have a tiny little bit here that you can make um, almost completely go away by also depleting the response from the ER. So it seems like both of them contribute a little bit, but the ER doesn't contribute much. So if you if you uh, empty the ER with hapsigargan and then you apply um, uh, ultrasound, you have extracellular calcium, you still see this very nice um, large response. So it's so the extracellular calcium is what's coming in when we apply the ultrasound. And to disentangle the fact that we were using a calcium reporter, we also look directly at voltage. So this is using ACE neon green, um, as a voltage, as a genetically encoded voltage sensor in neurons, we see this response uh, to ultrasound. And when we eliminate extracellular calcium, the depolarization goes away. Okay, so the calcium, it's not just needed for GCAMP, it's actually needed for the, for the, um, the neuron to respond uh, to the ultrasound. So what we know so far from the data I showed you is that it's likely mechanical, requires extracellular calcium. And also re recall that there's you know a couple hundred millisecond delay in the activation. Okay, so it's giving us some clues about what, what kind of molecular mechanisms uh, might be involved. And so naturally this makes us think about mechanosensitive channels and the repertoire, these are dissociated cortical neurons. Um, the repertoire of potential mechanoreceptors is pictured here <clears throat> that's been documented to be expressed in these cells. There's some famous ones here, uh, like PS1 and, and TRIP-V1. Uh, and we wanted to see which of them are responsible. So one way to, to do this is just, first of all, just use pharmacology. So we can, first of all, block all of them uh, using uh, gadolinium. Then we can do more specific blocks using these other reagents and just see what happens. So when we apply gadolinium, indeed, we see that we see a... a drastically reduced response. So mechanosensitive channels are indeed involved. And again, when we're doing these perturbations, including the gadolinium, we're not affecting the spontaneous activity. So these are very, relatively mild perturbations. So we see the significant reduction with gadolinium. Okay, so that tells us mechanical uh, ion channel, mechanosensitive ion channels are involved somehow. Now let's get more specific. When we use ruthenium red to block the trip V channels, we don't see much of a change. And when we use uh, suramin to block GPCRs, we also don't see much of a change. So it looks like trip channels and GPCRs are not significantly involved, at least in, in these uh, neurons responding to ultrasound. Um, when we use GSMTX4, which blocks piezo and trip C1, we do see a small but, but statistically significant reduction. So these channels might be um, in fact involved and we need to tease it apart further. But to tell apart between them or to look at some of these other channels, there's there wasn't a specific enough pharmacological tool to let us do that. And so then we turned to genetic knockdowns. And so we used um, uh, CRISPR to uh, knock out um, uh, uh, these channels that are pictured here. So for each of them, we created guide RNAs. And we showed that we can we can knock down part partially, not completely, um, these different uh, channels, and then again see what happens uh, to the response. And so you can see the efficiencies of knockdown are not 100%. So we're expecting a partial effect, we're looking for a partial effect on the ultrasound response uh, from each of these perturbations. And so what we learned from this is that there are in fact a couple channels that are involved. So first of all, the ones that are don't seem to be involved are trip M7 where there wasn't much of a difference, um, and piezo-1. But if we look at TRIP-C1, we see a, a significant 
change when we partially um, knock down trip C1. And we see even bigger responses to trip P1 and trip P2. So it seems like these are three specific mechano mechanosensitive channels that are responsive to, um, to ultrasound. So that's exciting to, to, to see that. Um, and then what happens? So these are all uh, calcium channels that will, would lead to calcium accumulation. So this perhaps could help us understand why we have that 100 uh, to 200 millisecond delay in our response. And so what happens then is that calcium accumulates. And then one possibility is that there are ion channels that are calcium activated sodium channels like trip M4, which when calcium accumulates to a sufficient level will become activated, let in a bunch of sodium and depolarize the cell and launch a train of action potentials. And so in fact, we see that when we knock down trip M4, we see this significant reduction in in the response so it seems to, to play a role and then downstream of that you'll also have voltage gated calcium channels which then will bring in that flood of calcium that will cause the big change um, under g camp and we see that as well so that allows us to paint a picture of the of the pathway that's involved here where we have ultrasound that is uh, somehow uh, activating mechanically the cells causing mechanosensitive ion channels to open calcium to accumulate that then uh, opens up this amplifier channel, uh, trip M4, which then allows sodium to come in, which then depolarizes the cell significantly enough to cause um, action potential uh, propagation. That's kind of a, the, the picture that we that we were um, able to to paint. And so one way uh, to test this is to see if we can amplify the response by now overexpressing the different players involved. Okay, so if we take trip C1. Uh, tri trip P2 and trip M4 and overexpress them, do we get enhanced responses? And this takes us then into the realm of sonogenetics, where we can potentially do this in specific cell populations and sensitize them to ultrasound. And it works. So here with trip C1, we see a significant increase in responses. Trip P2, we see a significant increase in responses. And um, when, when we do this with uh, trip M4, we see both an increase in the magnitude of, of, of the response and a reduction in the response delay, okay? Meaning that um, a lower level of calcium, presumably a lower level of calcium accumulation is sufficient now to trigger enough of these trip M4 channels to allow sodium to come in and depolarize the cell. So I think it's nice that we're, we're able to, to confirm um, our understanding uh, by doing these overexpression um, experiments. Um, so this is the molecular picture that we have, but it still leaves a ton of open questions. Um, you know, we, we think it's mechanical because mechani mechanosensitive ion channels are responding. And because um, uh, when we perturb the cytoskeleton, we see less of a response, but we have no idea exactly what is the deformation, the nanoscale deformation, and what are the forces, you know, what level of force, what, where are the forces being applied that we still don't have an understanding. So it's an open question that we and others in the field are pursuing that I, I think we still need to understand um, so that we can engineer the ultrasound stimuli, uh, engineer the channels and pathways to respond to it, and then potentially also engineer the cell mechanics um, to respond to it in a better way. So still still many open and interesting questions biophysically uh, within this field. Um, now, let me just mention the other level of organization. So the, on the organism scale. So at the same time that we were working with neurons and culture, we said, all right, let's take some GCAMP mice, expressing GCAMP in, in, in the cortex, these are thigh, thigh one GCAMPs, um, and um, apply ultrasound to them and do wide field calcium imaging just to see what's the, what's the ultrasound activating throughout the brain. And we made uh, an interesting discovery that kind of, uh, I would say, perturbed the field um, a little bit, which is that when we applied ultrasound, we tried to stimulate the visual cortex of the animals. We're using parameters similar to what other people in the field are using. Um, and what we saw when we did that is that instead of the visual cortex being the thing that's most strongly activated, we saw strong responses in the contra contralateral auditory cortex. So if you look at over time, this is at a few different intensities. As we're applying the ultrasound, we see the auditory cortex lighting up. Okay, so that's like made us think, okay, maybe there's, you know, some kind of auditory side effects, even though by definition, ultrasound is not supposed to be audible and the frequency that we're using is well outside the audible range for mice, that there, there seemed to be some kind of auditory um, coupling. So we um, studied this and, and quantified it. Uh, we showed that ultrasound activates um, auditory cortex and that there's a contralateral bias, meaning when I'm applying the ultrasound to this side, it's the other side that's being more activated, meaning it's the ear that's closest to the ultrasound that's, um, that's getting stimulated. Um, and when we compare the kind of cortical responses, the spatial temporal pattern that we get with ultrasound to ones that we get with audible sound that we play from the outside through air, they look very similar to each other. 
Whereas if we're flashing light and activating the visual cortex, where we're, we we're trying to activate with ultrasound, it looks quite different um, from these other two. Okay, so it looks looks like we discovered this, you know, auditory side effect of the ultrasound stimulation, um, and this is just just quantifying using a similarity matrix the fact that the ultrasound and the sound look like each other, uh, whereas the light flashes um, do not. So this pointed towards there being this um, the side effect, and in fact some of the motor activation that we think people have seen in the field can be a startle response where the animal is lightly anesthetized, it's hearing this loud sound, and then it's moving. And we showed that um, if we def deafen the mice uh, chemically, then we can greatly reduce this response in the deafened animals. Okay, so it, it seems like indeed there's a significant contribution there. And this was corroborated by an independent study that was published at the same time from University of Minnesota uh, from Hong San Guo and, and Hubert Lim that did this in guinea pigs with electrophysiology recordings, surgically deafened the animals and saw, saw a similar phenomenon. And so this um, uh, you know, created kind of a caution for the field that in addition to these kind of direct effects that we observe in culture and people have observed in vivo, there's also these off-target effects, uh, which are really important to understand, um, not because they're a deal breaker, but because when we do these kind of studies, we need to create proper sham controls um, and proper interpretation so we can inter understand what we're seeing. And mechanically, you know, for those of you who, who I'm sure are curious, well, you know, why do you get these auditory side effects? What we found from computational mechanical modeling, also this is do doing this in a mouse, is that when you apply ultrasound, you get these pressure waves that propagate into the brain. So that's that would be responsible for the, for the primary effect of stimulating neurons. But in addition, at the skull interface, you have a uh, wave mode conversion <clears throat> that's also creating shear waves that then can propagate. And so here in this example, the bones actually conduct them. So in the mouse, it goes all the way down the spinal cord and obviously would also get um, to, to, the, to the ears and can cause auditory side effects. And this is present in humans as well. So when we, we model computationally the human uh, cranium using viscoelastic mechanical modeling, we see the pressure wave propagating and then we also see the shear wave propagating. And after a relatively short time scale. Um, getting to the ears. So it's a, it's it's a, just a note of caution in this field that when you see studies, and, and these days after we publish these papers, <clears throat> I'd say most people are doing um, controls uh, with definite animals or, or otherwise uh, accounting for these potential auditory side effects. So exciting field, lots of open questions in it as well. Um, okay, I think I'm, I'm running out of time, but maybe I'll just spend one minute on this, uh, just to just tell you one idea, which is that kind of what is the ideal neuromodulation uh, technique. It wouldn't be wearing an ultrasound transducer all the time, but it would be something where you can use something like ultrasound to, to encode the location of the perturbation that you're trying to make, that you would use genetics to, to control specific cell types, and that you'd be able to control timing and dosing with something that ideally would be as simple as taking a pill. And so we developed this technology called acoustically targeted chemogenetics, where we're using ultrasound to specify where in the brain we're trying to modulate. And what the ultrasound is doing is opening the blood brain barrier at that location transiently and allowing viral vectors to enter the brain at that specific location. We're using AAVs here that then under a cell type specific promoter express a chemogenetic receptor, okay? And so what this lets you do is have a single ultrasound treatment that is then sensitizing a particular region of the brain to this pharmacological intervention and its specific cell types based on the viral vector encoding. So I'm gonna skip through all of this in the interest of time and just show you that it works. Um, where, and you can look up the details in the study here, where we were able to, this is completely non-invasively, uh, express chemogenetic, inhibitory chemogenetic receptors in the hippocampus of mice and inhibit memory formation in a fear conditioning task in these animals with an effect that worked about as well um, as uh, people had previously done with surgical um, injection. So I think th this technique, if I think about, um, you know, how we want to modulate things non-invasively or less invasively in the future, using the ultrasound as a delivery tool to specify where in the brain we want to have a molecular tool to enter, and then subsequently relying on the advantages of that molecular tool and, and the cell type specificity by having it be genetically encoded um, can, can give us um, a really nice paradigm for modulating specific brain regions. Okay, so I said a lot, probably spoke too quickly, and I apologize for that, um, but hopefully for those of you who are not familiar with ultrasound before, you, you now um, can see that ultrasound can be pretty awesome. And it is just becoming possible to uh, interface ultrasound with the brain.
it sounds as if we may have lost Michael. I hope he's going to come. Michael, can you hear us? Yes, hi. I'm we, coming back. We, we lost sound for a moment. Oh, sorry. Okay. When did I when did I disappear? Did I already was that on the conclusion slide? No, there was the, the on the very very last slide. So we got your message, and then suddenly okay. you just wanted to say, um, "I've been too fast," and then it, okay. it all went. Oh, okay. Um, all right. But, Let me just show um, the, the most much. important slide, the important yeah. slide, very quickly, and that's to acknowledge uh, acknowledge the lab um, that did the work that I showed you. Um, you know, it takes a very inter interdisciplinary group to do this kind of work, and I'm very lucky at Caltech um, to have such a such a wonderful team. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to take some questions. Yeah, so I have to say I'm I'm really impressed, and it's already on my list. Next time when I come to Caltech, I will knock on your door and say hello. Yes. Um, show show me one of these experiments. Um, sure. th this is this is wonder wonderful stuff. Thank you um, very much. And I can see that our audience is also fascinated. So there's um, questions on many different levels. There's one question here, very general. Um, does ultrasound imaging cause any changes to the organism due to the organ interaction with tissues, cells, molecules? Yeah. yeah, that's a fantastic question. And luckily the answer is no. Um, so the uh, for ultrasound imaging, we're sending very, very brief uh, pulses of sound that are going in and bouncing back and coming back to us. So the, the amount of energy that's deposited during imaging is negligible. So to actually get a perturbation effect, whether it's heating or mechanical, takes much longer ultrasound pulses uh, to be able to do that. So in fact, we can uh, nicely separate those two things. And that means in the future, um, we should be able to integrate those technologies to do both imaging and control at the same time. Another question along uh, more technical and methodological um, lines. Um, for the heat from the ultrasound, you have shown that the neurons are not modulated by the heat. Doesn't this change with the intensity? Um, yeah. Would higher intensity cause more heat? Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's a great question. And, and yes, the short answer is it would. Um, we were, we were uh, when we we're doing our biophysical study, we were trying to explain what people see in vivo. So we're using parameters that people already use uh, in humans and in animals, and those did not cause um, substantial heating. Um, if you increase the intensity, you will get heating. And in fact, some people have used that because when you heat, you can also inhibit um, the cells you know, uh, thermally. So, so in fact, you can get into the thermal regime, and, but then you know, of course you have to be very careful about not heating too much because then you might, you might cause some damage. Here's a question about the location of the ion channels. Are these mechanosensitive ion channels only found on the soma uh, or also on the axon? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I think the ion channels are primarily found on uh, just like where they're normally expressed is on, on soma and, and uh, dendrites. Um, and But we, what we haven't done is designed an experiment that tells us whether the the important ultrasound interaction is with ion channels in a particular, you know, subcellular location. I think that's something that that we're trying to figure out how to do in future experiments. Um, but yeah, it might, and, and I'm not, you know, I'm a, I'm a pretend ion channel biophysicist. Um, that uh, I think they're 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 not as many ion channels um, other than like sodium, you know, sodium and potassium channels along the um, along the the uh, the axons. Um. A lot of people were fascinated by your gas um, vesicle experiment. Does ultrasound, the, the, the signal emitted from the gas vesicles diminish over time during chronic stimulation? Yeah, great question. Um, the short answer is no. Like the gas vesicles are stable. Uh, they're, they're, they're a physically stable uh, uh, protein and the ultrasound, even as we're deforming it by causing it to buckle and so on, it's, it's reversible. So um, it seems to be stable. Um, having said that, you know, we, we, we've done imaging on the scale of an hour, um, you know, and we've done repeat imaging where we come back to the same animal over time. Um, but we haven't, um, you know, gone longer than that in a session. Um, so, so maybe if you, if you keep pushing it, then, you know, there would be some, um, you know, acoustic bleaching, right, to, to make an equivalent to, to photo bleaching um, that would happen. But it doesn't seem to be substantial. Now, there are questions more towards the applied side. Um, could we direct these gas molecules to a particular group of cells in an organ or a body? Yeah, 
yeah great question yes so that's 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 what we're doing right now so we in in um well so we're already doing you know even in, in some of the things i showed we're expressing that the genes encoding gas vesicles in specific in a, in a, a specific subset of cells like in 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 a tumor versus the rest of the mouse in, in the example i showed but yes so now we're we've expressed gas vesicles in about a dozen different cell types and of course we're interested in cells that are going to migrate that are going to have conditional expression yeah. patterns uh, and so on so that's all all in progress at the moment. So, uh, last question for you: um, Is it possible to use ultrasound to inhibit neuronal activity? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, so we haven't see, we haven't seen that in our own um, experiments, but there are other groups that have have played around with different parameters of ultrasound and seem to see in vivo that you can find um, acoustic conditions that, that do lead to inhibition. So you can check out um, the work of uh, Bin, Bin He uh, at Carnegie Mellon, uh, B-I-N-H-E, uh, um, that recently published in, I think, Nature Communications. <clears throat> and then there's gonna be a paper coming out soon from Stanford where they used fiber photometry and observed um, a similar kind of um, parameter dependent um, inhibition versus excitation. So it seems like it's possible, it, <clears throat> uh, to be fair, I, I think it's still, it's still messy uh, because we don't fully understand the mechanism um, and we don't know if it's exciting inhibitory neurons or inhibiting inhibiting excitatory neurons uh, and that's you know still a lot to figure out okay yeah so i can see you will be in business for the next couple of years <laughs> <laughs> thanks <laughs> it's, good, it's good to know yeah so um thanks very much mikhail yeah um, thank that you. Is, um, a, cl I, thank i've you seen already much. people clapping left right and center okay well thank you very well, much uh, peter thank you everybody and we are coming to the last talk of the session and this is guo song hong from um stanford and as um, seems to be the case these days, everyone is associated with at least two different uh, departments. So Guo Song is at home in the material science and engineering department, but he is also affiliated with the department of neuroscience at um, Stanford. And um, Guo Song, giving the last talk, tries to combine what we have heard in talk one and talk two. Um, he has the title, Seeing the Sound optical and ultrasound interfaces for neuromodulation. So, Guo Song, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much, Peter, for the nice introduction. And I'd like to thank the Science Magazine and the TCCI for organizing such a wonderful event. I've learned so much from the previous speakers. So thank you to uh, uh, Professor Yan and Professor uh, Shapiro for their wonderful presentations. So uh, we're, we are lab in material science now, which we actually develop tools based on materials advances to facilitate the research in biology and neuroscience. In particular, in today, uh, I'd like to share with you the optical and ultrasound interfaces based on materials advances for neuromodulation to metaphorically allow us see the sound. So our research is motivated by the spatial temporal limitations of existing neural technologies. We have already seen a few excellent uh, um, technologies in the previous talks about these emerging neural technologies. And all these technologies with, uh, are having the same goal of understanding the brain, one of the biggest mysteries in the universe. The brain is particularly complex system owing to the activity happening in multiple orders of magnitude in both space and time. If you look at the x-axis in this graph, we're looking at the activity in time ranging from millisecond level action potentials to sub-second to second level local field potentials, to hours and days for the memory learning process, all the way to years and decades of the neural development as well as the neural degeneration process. A similar eight to nine orders of magnitude span is seen in a spatial scale for neural activity, ranging from individual neurotransmitters to individual neurons, neural networks, as well as all the way to the entire brain level on the order of centimeters to meters. And this large scale actually contrasts strongly with existing conventional methods for neural interrogation modulation. On one hand, we have high resolution methods such as patch cam and sharp electrodes allowing us to understand individual cells and ion channels with a high spatial temporal resolution without the ability to understand the entire brain. On the other hand of the spectrum, we have large scale brain mapping techniques such as FMI, EEG, and ECOG that gives us a large scale mapping 
without the resolution of individual neurons. And then filling the gap in between on this graph are actually two emerging technologies at a mesoscopic scale. And one of them is actually neural pixels, uh, represented as neural pixels, and the other electrophysiological probes. Neural pixels and many other probes uh, uh, based on silicon allow us to measure the neural activity from individual neurons in the interconnected network. Of, uh, one of the challenges of this technology is that uh, the silicon-based probe has a mechanical mismatch with the tissue, thus leading to a chronic instability due to the, uh, the gliosis at the interface of the implanted probe. To address this challenge, large-scale long-term electrophysiological probes, including neural pixels 2.0, neural grid, as well as multifunctional fibers, have been developed to leverage uh, emerging algorithms as well as the emerging materials based on a, uh, uh, with a low Young's modulus and low bending stiffness uh, to facilitate a more intimate and a chronic interface uh, for long-term reporting. When I was a postdoc at Harvard, I was fortunate enough to um, help contribute to a project developing ultra-flexible mesh electronics that can flow, uh, float in saline and can also be injected into the brain to facilitate chronic recording in the mouse brain. We have demonstrated that we can report single neurons over the course of 34 weeks from the same animal's brain. Using the same technology, we have demonstrated the ability to inject electronics into the eye and have the electrodes unfold on the surface of the retina. And these many electrodes allow us to record the same retinal ganglion cells based on the different responses to an instant viral stimuli, and even allow us to track the change of individual retinal ganglion cells over the course, after, uh, over the course of a new generation after, after nerve crush. Besides the, electro, uh, the electrical probes, Another category of uh, emerging neural technologies in the microscopic seal involve the interaction of neural tissue with light, including optogenetics, as well as the calcium and voltage imaging. One of the challenges of, of, for all technologies using light uh, comes from the inability to deliver light through a deep, thick piece of tissue. We have heard the wonderful talk from uh, Wei Jian Yang on the um, you, the use of a two photon, the two photon holographic method for epigenetics and also the optical, electro, uh, optical electrophysiology methods in the three dimensional, uh, three dimensional volume of the brain tissue. So, we also wanted to address this challenge for delivering light into the deep brain from a different perspective, and that is based on the materials advances. So, here I would like to share with you two technologies that have been developed in our lab for sound optogenetics, which is basically converting sound into a light emission, thus enabling deep tissue optogenetics without optical fiber implantation. And the other one is to perform optogenetics in the infrared spectrum. So first of all, sound optogenetics is motivated by a major challenge for in vivo optogenetics, which is how to deliver light deep into the tissue. We know that actually light, especially visible light, gets scattered significantly as the photons travel in the tissue. Most of the options with their responses in, in the visual spectrum actually are um, limited by the um, insufficient penetration depths of photons. People have carried out simulation studies to reveal that for the 532 nanometer green light, it only penetrates less than one millimeter in depth in the mouse brain tissue. Therefore, in order to um, access any deep region of the brain, people will have to implant optical fiber. This optical fiber actually carries some intrinsic challenges, including acute damage to the tissue, a chronic immune response at the interface between optical fiber and the surrounding tissue, as well as interference with naturalistic behavior in social interacting animals because of this tether fiber interface. To mitigate, to mitigate this challenge, we'll have to understand how the scattering or the limited penetration scales as a function of wavelength. If you look at this graph, we see that actually scattering coefficient which represents how strongly photons get scattered, changes or scales as a function of wavelengths. We see that actually if you go to longer and longer wavelengths away from the visible, we can actually afford a deeper penetration owing to reduced scattering. Because of that, it has been demonstrated by the Desros lab here at Stanford that using carmine, which is a red-shifted and ultra-sensitive option, researchers can achieve transcranial optogenetics with red light with a fiber mounted on a skull instead of implanted into the brain tissue. Similarly, a Singaporean group has demonstrated the use of upconversion nanoparticles to convert 980 nanometer near infrared light, which affords even 
further reduce the scattering into local emission of blue light at 407 nanometers, also similarly enabling transcranial optogenetics. So we wanted to actually take this challenge. We wanted to answer this question by comparing this existing two methods or the two strategies of light delivery. On one hand, we can have an external light source. We have light shining on the outside of the body. It is non-invasive because there is no implant, but, it, but photons only, only penetrate to a shallow region of the tissue. On the other hand, if you want to deliver light efficiently into the deep tissue, we will have to implant something invasive into the tissue. We want to ask a question. Can we combine the advantages of both worlds to come up with a method that is both non-invasive as well as deep for light delivery? We have already heard from the previous talk that ultrasound can afford deeper tissue penetration. In fact, one megahertz ultrasound can penetrate into the tissue for over one centimeter, or over 10 centimeters, as opposed to 407 nanometer lights, which has penetration of less than one millimeter. So apparently we can use ultrasound. We can leverage the penetration of ultrasound to deliver light source. Unfortunately, there is no, no known mechanism to convert ultrasound into local light emission at a relatively low power density. But we are material scientists. We actually have no materials that can afford this conversion from ultrasound into light emission. So here, let me walk you, walk you through this process of one of such materials, zinc sulfide. Zinc sulfide is a direct band gap semiconductor. Electrons in the valence band can get excited by a photon and get excited to the conduction band. If this is a pristine zinc sulfide, or in other words, we don't have the electron trapping here, then this electron would immediately jump back to the valence band to give off the photoluminescence on the order of microseconds. And this process is uninteresting. It has nothing to do with ultrasound. We, as material scientists, introduce electron trap via defect engineering. So now, this electron, in the presence of electron trap, will be held in an electron trap without emitting the uh, light to release its energy until ultrasound kicks in. Besides being a direct band gap semiconductor, zinc sulfide is also piezoelectric. Or in other words, the mechanical stress induced by the focused ultrasound can induce charge separation which in turn leads to band tilting. Now this tilting band touches the electron trap and effectively eliminates the presence of the trap. This electron no longer feels the presence of the trap. It jumps back to valence band, transfers the energy to the emitter, and gives off the emission at 407 nanometers. So now with this entire process, you see we're using ultrasound to gate when the photoluminescence should occur. But it actually does not solve one particular issue which is this material can only be used once after delivered into a deep tissue because it has to be recharged by this UV photon. If we're having problem delivering a 407 nanometer blue light into the tissue, we will be having an even bigger issue delivering this recharging light to recharge this material. We were actually quite puzzled by this problem until we came up with what we thought as a relatively elegant solution. That is to leverage the endogenous circulatory system of the body. Blood vessels are per pervasive. They are every, everywhere in our body. Not only are blood vessels penetrating into the deep region of the brain, allowing us to deliver these nanotransducers into the brain, there are also vessels relatively shallow near the skin. Now, instead of recharging these materials prior to delivery, we can deliver these uncharged particles via systemic administration. After injection, these particles will circulate with the blood. Every time they pass through, this recharging site, which is the vessel superficially, very superficial to the skin, they can receive this recharging light in incident on the skin. They hold the energy, they flow with the blood until they pass through the focus of the ultrasound, somewhere in the deep brain. They will release the energy and acting as a local light source. After releasing the energy and emitting, they still stay inside the blood circulation. So they will pass through the recharging site again near the skin, they will carry the energy and they will get discharged in the brain again. And this process it keeps on and on and on until the particles are cleared out from the body. So then this process, if you look at it, this, this entire process, you may, you may realize this is basically just a battery. To be more exact, this is actually a flow battery. 
and it is actually an optical flow battery because it is recharged and discharging, discharging based on light instead of electricity. And we're actually turning the endogenous circulatory system into an optical flow battery. Now with this idea, I wanted to test if it works. So we actually first demonstrated that the mechanical luminescence, which is the emission wave spectrum of this material under focus ultrasound, indeed matches the activation spectrum of channel with absence. Now in the next video, I wanted to actually show you, allow you to really see the sound immediately from this PDM phantom, which we use to mimic the brain tissue. We dope the phantom with these materials, with these transducers. We charge the phantom, we place that on, on top of focus ultrasound transducer. Now let me play the video, and it will actually see this bright blue emission spot from the center of the phantom, which is actually can be visible even when the room light is on because intensity is quite strong. And we're actually, in, in, we actually seeing this, this spot get, getting weaker and weaker and more and more diffuse. And why is that? That's because we're actually constantly draining energy from the system without recharging it. In order to recharge it, we have to have a circulatory system. We first build this artificial circulatory system. We use the peristalsis pump to mimic the heart in the body. We charge these flowing nanoparticles near the left hand of the circulatory system. And then we discharge the particles with the focus ultrasound and using a camera to visualize the emission intensity. We found that with the recharging, every time the focus ultrasound strikes the material, we actually see a reproducible light intensity. But as soon as we stop recharging, we actually see an exponential decay of the intensity. That's because we're constantly taking out the energy as light emission, but we're not recharging it. So now with this, we actually used a bimineral inspired approach to synthesize a wide range of different emitters on the focus ultrasound, going all the way from 470 nanometers all the way to, 400, uh, to 650 to match the different activation spectra of opsins. So what we are actually achieving here is we have a pattern of materials that allow us to use the focus ultrasound to not just excite neurons via excitatory opsins, but also having the ability to inhibit certain neurons on the ultrasound. We have also characterized the spatial, res uh, the temporal resolution of this approach. We measured the latency time between the ultrasound is turned on and then when the light is emitted. And we found the latency time less than 10 milliseconds for all materials we have synthesized. This is actually very important because our genetics is acting very fast on the order of millisecond scale. And then we are proving here that the latency time of this, our system is not impeding the optogenetics from acting on the neurons with a millisecond temporal resolution. In addition to the temporal resolution, we have also characterized the special resolution of the light emitting spot. So these images are actually taking the real biological tissue. They're taking the liver. So we're actually penetrating, we're using the ultrasound to penetrate through the entirety of the liver and allowing us to see the focus of the spot on the surface of the liver. So this once again is metaphorically allowing us to see the sound. So we actually see a light emission spot with a cross-sectional diameter of less than 500 microns, which is on par with the light emission spot coming from an optical fiber. But unlike an optical fiber, this light emission spot is virtually produced. We don't have any physical contact with this light emission spot like an optical fiber. And then the ability of this approach really allows us to virtually scan the focus ultrasound, thus producing the emission spot in any location and any depth at will inside the body. So now having demonstrated the high spatial resolution and the high temporal resolution of this approach is ready to do some behavioral experiments. We inject this nanotransducer into the tail vein, have them circulate in the body. We recharge the particles when they are passing through the neck when the skin is relatively shallow. These particles will be discharged by the ultrasound focused in the brain. We have measured the power density of this emitter and we found the power density is facilitating the activation of opsins. And this is our setup. We only need to remove the fur, the hair from the scalp, and then we leave the scalp and the skull completely intact. There is no scalp removal or uh, craniotomy involved uh, in a typical optogenetic uh, experiment. We focus the ultrasound to the motor cortex of the right hemisphere. And we're testing the system in two groups of animals animals that express channel with opsin the motor neurons, as well as wild type animals without opsin expression. Within each group, we also compare the effect before and after the injection of this 
mechanical nascent nanotransducers. So now let me play the video. And every time the focus object is turned on, you will see the, lim the, the limb twitch in the left side of the body corresponding to the acti activation in the motor cortex. All the control experiments rule out the possibility that it is non-specific activation of the ultrasound that's producing the motor neuron response. What is really important about this technology is actually it can go beyond sound optogenetic activation because it enables a programmable intrava intravascular light source for any application that needs a light source deep in the body, ranging from optogenetics, fluorescent imaging, photodynamic therapy, photothermal therapy, light uh, optical control of cell signaling, or even op uh, light uh, switchable CRISPR Cas9 gene editing. So here I'd like to show you two brief examples to let you know how we are actually now using this intravascular light source for applications beyond optogenetics. The first one is actually to um, use this intravascular light source for brain imaging. We know that for brain imaging, we typically have to remove the skull or we have to thin or clear the skull to facilitate the visualization of the neurons inside the brain. That is because the skull has features and the features have the autofluorescence being so strong that when the external light source is used, which is basically a light source above the mouse head, the first thing that encounters and gets excited by the external, external light source is the skull. So as we have seen in this picture, if you're using a conventional wide field imager to look at the mouse brain expressing yellow fluorescent protein, what the most of the features we're realizing here uh, are coming from the cranium, the skull. But we want to ask a question. If this external excitation produced autofluorescence of a skull is the problem, why can't we change the direction of illumination? Why can't we turn this external illumination into an internal illumination enabled by the intravascular light source we have developed? And indeed, we have found that if we deliver this light source through the vasculature, we can now see all the neurons actually fluorescing with the real fluorescent protein from inside the brain instead of being obscured by the features in the skull. Another example shows that we can actually combine this ultrasound mediated in vivo light source with light controlled genome editing. We know that actually CRISPR Cas9 offers a genome specific therapy for a lot of genetic diseases, including spinal muscular atrophy, sickle cell disease, and many others. One way to deliver the, the Cas9 gene into the body is via the AAV injection. But every injection after systemic uh, administration goes everywhere in the body, which with the potential of target effect. So one way to mitigate this challenge is to develop photoswitchable Cas9, which is only activated when light strikes this protein, just like any other application that require light. We know that actually this protein will have a hard time receiving the light if the target of the genome ed editing is deep within the body. So now we want to ask a question. Instead of using a light controlled genome editing, why can't we combine ultrasound, me ultrasound media light source with this light controlled genome editing to come, to come up with ultrasound media genome editing? So here we actually, I'm showing some preliminary data in here. With ultrasound, we're indeed seeing an increase of the bioluminescence intensity, which is a readout indicator for the genome editing effect. So we're seeing a significant increased uh, genome editing effect when the ultrasound strikes the, the material as opposed to very little intensity without, without ultrasound. This approach actually could afford, afford a few advantages. It is minimally invasive, it is deep tissue penetrating, and also offers a spatial temporal precise focusing enabled by the high frequency ultrasound we're using in this particular case. So besides this sound opera genetics or this intravascular light source that I share with you, I also wanted to share with you another story using a bio-inspired approach to enable opera genetics using infrared light. We've already seen that actually the ultrasound could enable transcranial optogenetics uh, by producing light inside the, inside the brain. How, however, th this method I described just now has one significant drawback, which is the transducer has to stay on top of the mouse head all the time. That's because ultrasound will have a hard time propagating in free space without the use of ultrasound gel. On the other hand, what we're seeing is that conventional optogenetics using an optical fiber. With, with the implant in the brain, as well as the constraint of the animal's behavior. We wanted to ask a question. Can we completely remove all the brain implants or the head tethering to free the animal 
for the naturalistic movement, especially in the social interacting environment. So this is our goal. We want to actually develop an implant and tether-free method to enable through, through scalp neural modulation. Apparently, in order to achieve this cap capability, we will need to find a form of energy that can propagate in free space that is in air. And one such form of energy is just electromagnetic, electromagnetic wave or light. We have already seen that actually light does not afford deep penetration. That's because of a scattering. Scattering is very significant in the visible, visible region. But if you go to the longer and longer region, all the way to the 1700 nanometer, which we call the short wave infrared, also known as the second infrared region, the scattering is significantly reduced. When I was a graduate student, I was fortunate to work on a project that allows, allows me to demonstrate that fluorescence, this intrinsic fluorescence coming from carbon nanotubes in this particular SWIR region enables transcranial imaging of brain vasculature. So shown here is a mouse head with the hair removed. There's nothing down to the skin to, or to the skull. Typically, if you perform the brain vascular imaging by delivering floral force into vasculature, into blood circulation, what you get is actually a very blurry feature. That's because of the significant scattering in the scalp and the skull. But now, if we are looking at the fluorescence beyond 1,500 nanometers, in the same mouse brain, this is what we get. We're actually seeing all this vasculature much more vividly through the intact scalp and skull, benefiting from the reduced scattering. Now we wanted to actually apply this also for neuromodulation. But for neuromodulation, since light comes from the outside and, and we hope to have the light penetrating deep into the brain, we have to consider another type of light tissue interaction, that is absorption. So we have to consider uh, the combina combination effect of both scattering and absorption, thus leading to the extinction spectrum of the brain in the entire 400 to 1800 nanometer region. So here what we're seeing is actually decaying baseline in the visible region corresponding to the scattering that we have seen earlier. But on top of this decaying baseline, we're seeing some features of absorption peaks. We're seeing absorption from hemoglobin. We're seeing absorption from water beyond 1400 nanometers. And the competition between scattering and absorption yields a global minimum at 1064 nanometer right here. And this actually comes really handy because the 1064 nanometer light is available from the ND YAG laser. So unfortunately, none of the existing options can respond to 1064 nanometer light in a wide field. The longest wavelength for carmine is actually still at 635. So then we wanted to ask a question. Can we look into nature to find the molecular machines that will afford the activation of a particular ion channel by this 1064 nanometer infrared light? And indeed, rattlesnakes in, in, in nature actually have, can sense the infrared radiation all the way to one millimeter in wavelengths using a specialized organ called the pit organ, which is this little hole be below their eyes. And the pit organ is basically a cavity supporting a membrane called the pit membrane with a high expression of trip A1 channel, or in other words, the transient receptor uh, potential um, A1 channel. A very little, very small temperature increase of the trip A1 channel actually can drive significant neuron response in the pit organ. Two years ago, it also has been demonstrated that people can couple the golden rods, which have the infrared absorption, with the trip V1 channel, a different member, a different subfamily of the trip uh, family of the channels, to impart near infrared sensitivity to rodents at 800 nanometers. We wanted to ask a question. Now, can we ectopically express the trip V1 channel in mammalian neurons, in the mouse neurons in the brain for infrared optogenetics with deep tissue penetration? We actually tried expression of trip V1 channel in the mouse brain first, but it didn't work. It turns out actually, just like the photopigments in our eye sensitize the photoreceptors in allowing us to see things, we also need a photosensitizer to sensitize the trip one channels in the system. Being material scientists also allows us to sensitize this particular sensitizer. We made this molecule, which we call the micromolecular infrared neurotransducer for deep brain stimulation, or MINDS in short, which is basically comprised of a conjugated core called a PBBTV that allows to tune the maximum absorption all the way to 1,064 nanometers. 
On top of that, we're using PRGA PEC to improve the, the water solubility. We have done the simulation to prove that when this uh, a globulus of the uh, this mines particles are injected to the into the brain at a depth of five millimeters, the mines can actually concentrate the instant photons, pre preferentially absorb the photons therein while sparing the absorption of these photons in the over overlying brain tissue and scalp and skull. Now with the simulation, we actually now move on into some experiments. We first demonstrated these experiments in, in, in vitro using hex cells, the human embryonic kidney cells expressing tubular channel. We shine light to the cell culture with the light gets absorbed by mines, which then converts the energy to the tubular channel. We're using calcium imaging to realize the calcium flux through the tubular channel. So here in this video, you can see that when the laser is off, the calcium signal is relatively low, but as soon as the laser is turned on, we're seeing this massive calcium signal in the cell culture. To prove that this effect is indeed coming from the design, we performed this other control experiments to prove the sufficiency and necessity of having both trip one channels as well as the mines to drive the activation when the laser is turned on. These control experiments also rule out the possibility of ER calcium release or membrane capacitive current as the main drive for the calcium intensity because both the ER calcium release as well as the membrane capacitive current are known to produce calcium uh, signal as well. Now, having demonstrated in vitro, we move on to in vivo experiments. We inject the trip, uh, channel encoding viruses as well as the mines particles into the hippocampus. And then we shine light from above the mouse head. We measure, we use the implanted electrodes to measure the extracellular action potential in response to laser irradiation at 1064 nanometers. We observed a significant increase of the firing rate, ranging from 10, 10 hertz all the way to 100 hertz when the light is turned on. And then we also proved that this, be, this response is specific only to the experimental group when we have both trip one and mines. Now, having demonstrated this with electrophysiology, now it's time for some behavior experiments. We first injected this virus encoding trip one channel into the secondary motor cortex of the left hemisphere followed by the injection of mines in the same region. And then we switched the skin back uh, because this injection is quite minimally invasive. And then we can actually uh, place the animal in a arena with the overhead illumination of this infrared light. What you can see is that when the laser is off, the mouse is not moving much. But as soon as the laser is turned on, the mouse actually exhibits the rotational behavior and the rotation is always to its right side of the body. And then when the laser is turned off, you will see that actually the animal returns to its inactivity, just like before. We have also analyzed the rotational speed, which is basically the angular speed uh, for different groups of animals to prove the specificity of this approach. And we also use the immune staining of CFAS, which is an immediate early gene that labels recent neural activity to prove the sufficiency and necessity of trip one mines as well as in the infrared light. The modulation of motor cortex is interesting, but it's actually not the most impressive. That's because the motor cortex is relatively shallow. Even with a shorter wave of light, even with some scattering, we still can reach that region. So now we wanted to ask a question. Can we inject this? Can we demonstrate the, fit, the efficacy of this approach in a deeper brain region? We choose the VTA or the ventral tachymanal area as a target for two reasons. First, the VTA is relatively deep, is actually located at the bottom of the mouse brain. So if we can actually use the infrared light to go all the way through the entire brain to reach the VTA, there's really no other region of the brain that we cannot reach. Second, VTA harbors a large population of dopaminergic neurons that use dopamine as the neurotransmitter. Dopamine is known as our brain's reward uh, currency in a way. So we can use a simple conditioned place preference test to test the efficacy of this approach. So our hypothesis is that if we have the animal moving its Y maze, every time it enters this red dashed box in the left uh, bottom, bottom left arm of this Y maze, it will receive the overhead infrared uh, radiation from one meter above. And then we hypothesize that by activating dopaminergic neurons specifically using this approach, we will be able to make the animal associate the, spe the specific grating at the end of this arm with the infrared illumination at that particular location. 
We have demonstrated that in the pretest, when the animal is first placed into the wine maze, it does not show much preference for any of the arms. In the next following days, the uh, next three following days, every time the mouse enters this left corner in here, you will receive the overhead illumination without seeing it because it's beyond its visibility range. After three days of training, this is what we see. The animal exhibits a strong preference towards this particular area where it received three days uh, training of the illumination um, in this particular region. We have also proved that this method is specific. Only when we have both the trivial expression and mind's injection can we get this press preference. In addition, we use the immunostaining of CIFA to prove the sufficiency uh, and the uh, necessity of all the components of the design. Importantly, we have found a good overlap between TH positive neurons, these are basically dopaminergic neurons in the VTA, and the CFAS positive neurons, thus validating the ability of neuron type specific modulation with overhead transcranial and the transdermal near infrared neuron, uh, near infrared light. Because near infrared light could cause some uh, local tissue temperature variation, we have also demonstrated that um, these, there is actually no significant tissue temperature increase that cause damage to microglia, neurons, neurofilaments, astrocytes, as well as apoptotic cells. Lastly, I wanted to share with you our, some of our thoughts, what this can be used for. Mouse, mice and social animals, just like us. So when we are doing the animal experiments, IntelliCage actually affords a great opportunity for us to study multiple interacting animals at the same time. Having a head tether is actually a significant impediment for this kind of a study. So now we can actually free the animals from any implant or head tether and using overhead illumination to modulate one animal at a time and observe its behavior change. In addition, some other social interacting animal experiments such as a tube dominance test can also benefit from this technology. We are still actually uh, having some um, current limitations of the technology. For example, the off time is relatively long, which also results in a long, uh, uh, some thermal diffusion over this long time scale. The current approach also requires two consecutive injection of the virus, as well as the polymeric nanoparticles, which is similar to optogenetics based on upconversion nanoparticles. To mitigate these challenges, we're currently conducting genetic engineering to encode the infrared absorbing pigments into trip expressing neurons that show heat rate sensitivity instead of absolute temperature sensitivity, thus also giving us the ability to reduce response time. So I hope I've convinced you that with this sonar epigenetic approach, we have the ability to focus ultrasound into a particular region of the brain to produce a virtual light source therein. It is not just the non-invasiveness that actually makes this technology interesting, but it's because we are having this virtual light source, we can relocate this light source anywhere in the brain at will. So this will really allow us to perform so-called quote unquote scanning optogenetic stimulation in the brain, as well as in the interior nervous system, and then find out how different regions would work synergistically towards a particular function of the brain or the behavior of the subject. In addition, I hope I have convinced you that infrared neuromodulation can actually give us the ability to modulate socially interacting and freely behaving animals. And we are also using the genetic engineering tools to make this an easier system to use than in, than in its current stage. Taking one step further, we're also developing metal materials in radio frequency to hopefully enable wireless neuromodulation using radio waves. The benefit of radio waves is that it actually penetrates even deeper than light or sound. So then potentially with these metal materials, we'll be able to modulate the entire brain of mice or even in humans. And I look forward to sharing this research with you in a future opportunity. So before I close, let me thank the students who did the work and now as well as my collaborators. This work has also been uh, generously supported by many funding agencies. So here I'd like to thank them as well. So I'd like to thank all of you who attend my talk and I look forward to discussion with you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. This is the most fascinating presentation. Um, I get the impression that we have started 
this um, particular session this year just at the right moment. Um, when looking at all the three presentations we've seen today, it looks to me as, <coughs> as if we are at an inflection point. Um, many of the techniques have come online. Um, they will all be improved in the coming years, and then we can apply them to a number of questions that before now were just not possible um, to, uh, to tackle in, in this depth. Um, so now I'm inviting the audience to come up with um, questions. I'm pretty sure that there will be a number of questions concerning such a presentation. Ah. Here is one. Um, as the skull thickness increases with the size of the animal, is it possible to perform similar techniques in larger animals? And um, the, the uh, um, participant asks even um, non-human primates. Yeah, this is, this is an excellent question. So we have not advanced to that stage yet, but we're currently working with a collaborator at Stanford to come up with a face array antenna, face array uh, transducer. Uh, yeah. to steer the beam inside the brain and also to correct for any possible aberration of the wavefront uh, due to the, the thicker uh, skull in, in non-human primates and even humans. Yeah, so do you think um, down the line um, at some stage you will be able to go to humans? Yeah, so this is also, you know, uh, on one side, you know, we have to be concerned with the relatively thick skull due to attenuation. But there is also another concern, which is the material we're currently using. Uh, you probably have noticed that uh, we're using inorganic materials. And these are materials that, uh, you know, give us the ability of the ultrasound media emission due to their defects. And these materials, unfortunately, actually are really reluctant to be degraded, to uh, be degraded in the, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the body. We have noticed that some of the materials actually could stay in the liver for months. And that's actually pretty long in the mouse. Um, and then we, we, experience, we, we anticipate a similar situation that we have to deal with if we apply this thing to humans. But the one promising direction now we're taking is actually moving away from these inorganic materials to some organic formulations that can be quickly degraded, also using the FDA recommended approved formulations. So one of them is actually using a liposome to actually encaps encapsulate some of the uh, uh, mechanoluminescent materials, which are also organic molecules to facilitate the same uh, ultrasound mediated light source. We have been collaborating with uh, uh, Dr. Evan Wan's lab at uh, UT Austin for, for, that, for, for, that, for that particular formulation. Uh, hopefully uh, we will be able to share that results uh, with everyone in the near future. Here's a question concerning material toxicity. Maybe you can say a word or two about this. Yes, yeah, exactly. So currently, you know, <clears throat> sulfide, we don't anticipate much of toxicity, but it's really the dopant ions that would lead to potential toxicity. In order to make these pristine materials into uh, uh, defective materials that would give this emission, we will need to introduce some of the rarest elements. And most of the rarest elements are actually considered the heavy metals. So although they are actually at the trace amounts, but uh, we have not fully evaluated the toxicity in large animals. We have demonstrated the minimal toxicity in mice, but we don't think that's, efficient, that's sufficient. So we'll have to actually uh, fully consider the toxicity before moving on to larger animals. But at the current stage, what I can um, tell uh, whoever asked this question that uh, you know, um, uh, we, we do not see uh, uh, particular damage to all the major organs uh, in the body by using uh, HNE staining. We don't see particular uh, damage to the brain tissue by staining for neurons and glial cells. And then we also do not see a significant change in the body weight over time after the material administration. Um, and lastly, we have also performed the uh, uh, pharmacokinetic study to prove that um, um, these materials can circulate in the body for about half an hour before they actually go into the liver. But then once they go to the liver, they just get very slowly cleared away uh, from the body over the next uh, couple of weeks. Uh, yeah, yeah. So you have already um, um, pointed towards the, the, the next question. Um, how long do you think can it stay within the brain? Yeah. Yeah, so that's actually a, a good point. So we, we want actually, we don't want them to stay in the brain, but we want them to actually keep circulating in the body. 
because the ability to circulate gives us the ability to recharge. Right. Yeah, right. because if they stay in the brain, there will be no uh, portal for us to recharge them. So that time window is on the order of between 10 minutes to 30 minutes, which is sufficient for some operational experiments, but actually is still not facilitating for some long-term modulation. We anticipate that if there is a need for long-term modulation, we'll have to do multiple doses of injection. We have uh, proved that uh, so far we can do two injections spaced six hours apart while still being able to not see uh, significant toxicity to the animals. Um, so here's a question more on the applied side. Um, do you think you could use this technology to visualize brain metastases? Yeah, this is also a great question. So one of the challenges of realizing the brain is also coming from the same problem, which is the light scattering and the limited penetration depth of light. Right. So now right. what we're thinking is that we call this actually a, uh, uh, so very similar to actually photoacoustic imaging. So photoacoustic imaging takes the lighting and it produces a sound wave. And the sound wave penetrates much deeper, allowing us to see, um, you know, deeper into the tissue. Our method is actually kind of like the reverse way. We are always, ours is, is more like acoustic optical method. We're sending the sound wave, which penetrates really deep and we collect all the light coming out. So basically we can actually come up with a, almost something similar to confocal. We do the raster scanning using the ultrasound. And then for every point, we collect all the photons coming from the animal. Or better yet, we can probably leverage the circulating particles. Leveraging the fact that some of them will actually get close to the skin and use the skin as a readout of their uh, luminescence intensity. And using that way, we'll be able to form a large map of the scanned uh, ultrasound. So that could be a one way to, to facilitate deep visualization using the circulatory light source. Hmm. So it sounds very promising. So here's a question. Um, you showed these um, leg twitch um, experiments. Um, the idea here is, could the leg twitch response be impacted or resulting from the ultrasonic flinch response that we have seen in the earlier talk by Michael Shapiro? Yes, that's an excellent question. You know, we, we have been uh, actually concerned with this possibility and uh, that's why we carried out actually control experiments to make sure that when there is no particles injected into the circulation using the same frequency, power, pulse duration and the pulse frequency we're not getting the limb twitch to the same extent. And then we actually also went back to the twitch to find out why we're not seeing this non-specific ultrasound modulation. It turns out that we are using a relatively high frequency of the ultrasound. Our materials are responsive to the frequencies in the range between 1.5 megahertz all the way to five megahertz, which is much higher than this non-specific modulation using less than one megahertz ultrasound. In addition, we're using a relatively low uh, duty cycle, usually 10, 20% or even lower uh, to, uh, and then with also very small pulse repetition frequency on the order of one hertz. So and, uh, I believe all this combined together lead to the, our inability to modulate the neural activity using ultrasound alone. And uh, one last thing I want to mention is the uh, spatial peak pulse average intensity or the ISPPA of this particular um, uh, you know, experiment is at 10 watts per centimeter square. And then there has been publication to show, uh, showing that at this ISPPA, as, as well as the uh, uh, 1.5 megahertz frequency, the success rate of producing non-specific limb twitch is below 20%. So there is still, still a chance to produce limb twitch, but we have carried out the um, statistical analysis to compare our results with the um, control group. Thank you very much. Um, I see that there are no more questions. So I think we can conclude today's session. Um, let me just briefly summarize my thoughts. I knew that this would be a fantastic session. I mean, when we selected the speakers, we knew that they were, were doing extremely fascinating stuff. But now looking at it, I think that all of you have exceeded my expectations. This is really extremely um, stimulating and I'm 
going home now um, full of enthusiasm for what's going to come in the next in, in, in the coming years. And um, so I hope um, you all have seen what is possible. And I hope that you all will join us tomorrow for the second round when we are talking about the topic of um, brain computer interfaces. So um, let's conclude the session for today and say thank you to our speakers again. So and we see each other tomorrow at the same time. Bye bye.